Now we are live. My screen visible? Yes. Okay, seven thirty will start. So, good evening, dear friends. Uh, greetings from Indian Orthoplasty Association, and welcome to the seventeenth webinar of Indian Orthoplasty Association. I am Subhranshu Mohanty. The present president of Indian Orthoplasty Association. We started it in 1995 and completed 25 years last year and continuing with the 26th year this year. You can find details about our association in our website, Indian Orthoplasty Association.com. And if you have any suggestions to offer, please email us at Indian Orthoplasty at gmail.com or in my personal email ID, Dr. SS Mohanty at hotmail.com. We have created two WhatsApp groups for our life members, IA1 and IA2. If you have not already a member of one of these groups, then please uh, send me a message at my number mentioned below so that I can make you a member of this one of these groups. We continue with the case discussions and all the academic discussions in this group. And we also post all our announcements of the Indian Orthoplasty Association in this group. Today, it is the 17th Indian Orthoplasty Association 360 degree interactive webinar series. And today it is focused on patellofemoral arthrosis, how far have we come? And during the last you know, two years, I've been attending a lot of webinars and I have seen that very, very few webinars probably focused on this aspect of the knee, patellofemoral arthrosis, and especially for orthoplasty surgeons. And we conduct our webinars on the third Saturday of every month, and today being the 19th June, and uh, this is the third Saturday of this month. And our convener is Dr. Manuj Vadwa, who is the chairman and executive director of Elite Institute of Orthopedics and Joint Replacement at Mohali, Punjab. Manuj is the, you know, part of the designer surgeon of the Anthem Knee of Smith and Nephew as well, and he will guide us through this webinar. We have three eminent overseas surgeons who are invited faculty today and two surgeons from our own country. And the overseas surgeons are from far west and from far east. That's why it is difficult to catch them during this uh, time. Dr. David Rowinski is the assistant clinical professor and attending orthopedic surgeon at Queen Emma Clinic, which is a division of surgery of John A. Byrne School of Medicine at the University of Hawaii in the United States. And as you know, at Hawaii now it's early morning, 3.30 a.m. and David must be still sleeping. And when he wakes up, we'll take him into discussion when it is probably five or six o'clock in the morning. He's also at the Sinners Hospital for Children in Honolulu and Puai Veterans Memorial Hospital and Myelona Medical Center. He's a diplomat of American Board of Orthopedic Surgery and fellow of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and American College of Surgeons as well. And he has got numerous publications in journals and book chapters. We welcome Dr. David today to our webinar. Our next invited speaker is Dr. Martin Redis. He is uh, last 25 years has been a consultant orthopedic surgeon in Tennessee, USA, attached to the Park Ridge Medical Center, Memorial Hospital, and Erlanger Medical Center. He is a part of the design and development team for lateral unicondylar arthroplasty for the micro corporation, as well as he's part of the group of international design and development for fixed bearing unicondylar knee of Biomed. He is the past clinical assistant professor of UT College of Medicine for over 10 years from 1990 to 2000. Welcome Dr. Martin today from Tennessee. And from Far East, Associate Professor Rami Shuriel is a great friend of mine and is a great friend of Indian Orthoplasty Association as well. 
Rami is the adjunct associate of, of professor at University of Sydney and head of the department of Napien Hospital at Sydney. He is the chief medical advisor of Asia Pacific Gimer Biomed and he is the scientific chairman and past president of Asia Pacific Arthroplasty Society. And we welcome Rami today, who has been the backbone of FS and also a great friend of, uh, you know, Indian Arthroplasty Association. Besides our overseas speakers, we have two eminent orthopedic surgeons in the sports medicine field from our own country. Dr. IPS Oberai is the president of the Indian Arthroscopy Society and is the director of orthopedic sports medicine joint reconstruction and arthroscopy at Artemis Hospital, Gurgaon. And uh, if you see during the past uh, couple of years, whatever webinar related to sports medicine, Dr. IPS is there in almost 99.999% webinars. And uh, also most importantly is the IPS is also our life member of Indian Arthroplasty Association and is a very old life member from the beginning he has joined Indian Arthroplasty Association. Welcome Dr. IPS to the Padi webinar. And our dear friend, Dr. Dinsa Padiwala, who is a, you know, KM orthopedic alumni. He graduated and post-graduated from, you know, KM Hospital Mumbai. At present, he's the director of sports medicine and shoulder at Kokilaben Dhirubhai Ammani Hospital at Mumbai. He's a member of Ishakas and India representative at International Cricket Council Medical Committee. He has won the prestigious Isakas John Joyce Award in 2009, and he has treated many sports celebrities, and all of them have gone back towards their sporting activities after Dinsa's treatment. Welcome, Dinsa, today to our webinar, and we are very happy to have you here today. Dear friends, there is a disclaimer before we start our webinar. In view of the stringent patient privacy laws, in the country, any breach of confidentiality of patient information during the course of this clinical meeting and webinar would be the complete responsibility of the presenter. The Indian Orthoplasty Association would not be held liable in case such a breach were to occur during the meeting or from viewership of the proceedings of the meeting in the near or distant future. Moreover, this is a digital online platform and is connectivity dependent we would request the participants to kindly bear with us in case of an inadvertent technical failure hindering the connectivity of our meeting. We express our sincere regrets in the event of such an occurrence during the meeting. Dear friends, in addition to that, we have Dr. Krishna Kiran from Hyderabad, and he is going to head the panel discussion and take us through the, the couple of cases related to partial femoral joint and also plastic related to patellofemoral joint. Now, without any ado, I hand over the proceedings to our convener today, Dr. Manuj Vadva, to go ahead with the proceedings. Manuj, please, all yours. Thanks, dear President, Dr. Mahanti. Uh, I was put to a huge challenge uh, holding this webinar on patellofemoral arthrosis, which is uh, uncommon, but very upcoming in the international world. Other part is majority of this patellofemoral practice in the international world is held by sports guys. So we wanted to have blend of both sports and plastic guys to convene us through. Also, we have an extinguished and uh, distinguished faculty from overseas as well as India to sail us through on this topic. And uh, I hope all of us carry back exceptional knowledge on this subject. Since it's a diverse topic, so we will have a 360-day cover on patellofemoral arthrosis, starting from the basic kinematics of the patellofemoral joint, where Dr. IPS will lead us through and Dr. Dinsha will tell us about joint preservation systems, basically non-arthroplasty. From there on, we will go on to the basics of patellofemoral joint replacement. Moving on to the compartmental arthroplasty, the medial lateral uni or a combination of uni with a PFJ. There on our basic standards where I'll be speaking on uh, tips and pearls for patellar resurfacing in total knee arthroplasty. What is the right way? What is our experience? We'll share it through. And Dr. Rami Sorel will guide us 
if you have a bone loss in a revision case scenario or a primary scenario, what is an augmented patella? And from here on, we would invite our first speaker of the day, Dr. IPS Obrai, to sail us through on basic kinematics of patellofemoral joint. Uh, thank you, Manoj. Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, uh, so this is a topic which is quite pertinent to uh, patellofemoral arthrosis. And we talk about some biomechanics of the patellofemoral joint. In this presentation, I'm going to take through you to what is the normal kinematics of a patellofemoral joint and how does it predisposes us to a patellofemoral arthrosis. The patellofemoral kinematics considerations when we are designing an implant and for patellofemoral arthritis and what are the kinematic factors which we need to be kept in mind while you try to conduct an arthroplasty in a patellofemoral arthrosis so that we get the best survival and the best results. If you look into the patellofemoral joint, this is essentially a very typical joint where isolated patellofemoral arthrosis is secondary to kinematic disorders, unlike tibiofemoral joint, where there are so many reasons of a tibiofemoral arthritis. Subtle abnormalities in kinematics and anatomy predisposes a patellofemoral joint to eventually go into chondromalacia and finally into arthritis. So understanding patellofemoral kinematics is important to understand the precursor, why does the arthritis happen? And whenever you are treating the arthritis, what modifications need to be done in the altered kinematics of the PF joint so as to get the optimum outcome. There are certain, certain silent anatomical considerations which are important when we look into anatomy of the patellofemoral joint. Patella is an important structure which increases the lever arm of the extensor mechanism and displaces the force vector away from the center of the knee rotation. What does that mean? That means that at different angles of knee flexion, the contact between the patella and trochlea would alter. And studies have shown that the maximum contact between the femur and patella is at around 45 degrees of knee flexion. Which means to say that the forces between the patella and the femoral joint, which is patellofemoral joint reaction forces, would keep on increasing as the knee would go from extension into flexion. And this has been well documented that by doing stair climbing, the patellofemoral joint reaction forces increase by 3.5 times. And if the patient is doing deep bends quite often, the patellofemoral joint reaction forces increases to seven to eight times. Essentially, if your occupational hazard involves a lot of stair climbing, deep bending and squatting, the increased patellofemoral joint reaction forces does predispose you to isolated patellofemoral arthritis. Number two important consideration about patellofemoral joint is the stabilizing factor. Patella is a sesamoid bone which is inside the extensor mechanism and it needs to be stabilized well in the trochlear groove so that kinematic movement of the knee joint is good. There are static stabilizers as well as dynamic stabilizers. The most important step, static stabilizer, is MPFL, which means medial patellofemoral ligament, and it provides around 60% of static stability to the joint. Sorry, I think. Yeah. Then there are dynamic stabilizers, which include muscles around the knee joint, and these are vastus medialis and lateralis. Most important dynamic stabilizer is the VMO, vastus medialis obliquus. And this means that while rehabilitating any patient of patellofemoral arthritis or chondromalacia, stimulation and exercise of VMO is pretty most important. Now, when you look into these static stabilizers, you tend to realize that different degrees of knee flexion are stabilizing factors are different. So if knee is more or so in extension, which means the flexion is less than 30 degrees, the most important knee stabilizer is MPFL followed by medial retinaculum and BMO muscle. 
but as the knee goes more into flexion from 30 to 60 degrees the groove anatomy of the trochlea becomes more important so if the patella is subluxated in a patient with patellofemoral arthrosis and knee is essentially in extension you must look into insufficiency of mpfl and if the knee is getting subluxated due to in when the knee is in flexion between 30 and 60 degree try to understand that the damage is essentially in trochlear groove anatomy there could be dysplasia of trochlear groove so surgical management of any kind of arthritic phenomenon in form of an arthroplasty would also need to be addressed that you might need to do an mpfl augmentation or reconstruction or a trochlear groove reorientation surgery whenever you are doing any arthroplasty surgery in patellofemoral joint because if you don't alter that kinematic abnormality eccentric loading of the patellar component is going to happen and these shear forces are going to result in loosening of the component there are articles which clearly say that medial patellofemoral ligament is a very important ligament in patellofemoral joint kinematics and patellar stability and it is essential for us to see for competency of mpfl whenever you are taking any patient for a knee patellofemoral arthroplasty surgery important consideration needs also to be given where is the location of patella and that is important as far as patella alta is concerned when a patient has got a patella alta this would take the longer time for patella to reach into the bony constraint of femoral trochlea which means whenever a patient has patella alta there are more chances of patella getting subluxated and in such cases probably when you try to do an arthroplasty there are indications where you have to do a distal tibial tubercle uh, recession or to bring patella a bit more lower so that you are able to position patella well in front of the trochlear notch so there might be some concomitant procedures might which might be required when you are contemplating an arthroplasty in a patient which has got a high riding patella patella alta important also is to preoperatively assess their dysplasia in the patellofemoral joint dysplasia could be in the patella dysplasia could also be in the trochlear groove whenever there is a dysplasia there there is an increased malt lacking and tilting of patella which would increase the patellofemoral pressures and reduce the patellofemoral contact area such patients would have subluxated patellas and doing an arthroplasty in these cases where you don't take care of the dysplasia which is there might lead to subluxated patellofemoral joint so certainly you might need to design an implant which takes care of a trochlear and a patellar dysplasia in a patient where this dysplasia is a very significant factor which is predisposing this patient to a patellofemoral arthrosis and there are articles which actually say that whenever there is patellofemoral abnormality in form of patella alta or trochlear dysplasia these patients have high incidence of isolated patellofemoral arthrosis which means to say that if you are planning an arthroplasty in these patients you have to address both patella alta and dysplasia to a certain level patellar tilt is also important because clinically when you see the patella is tilted on the side it indicates secondary structures which are tight especially the lateral retinaculum and this would lead to a lateral patellar tilt and increased chance of arthritis again when you contemplate the surgical procedure either a reconstruction or a replacement in such joints you have to balance the patella in the trochlear groove which means you might need to do an additional procedure to balance the lateral retinaculum so that the compression forces on the lateral side are reduced q angle is also uh, also uh, thought to be pathological which predisposes to patellofemoral arthrosis it has been said that male has got a q angle of around 13 degrees and females and an average of 18 degrees and it is contemplated that if it is more than 20 it might be pathological however there are contradictory findings which are saying that probably q angle has not got too much of role into patellofemoral uh, kinematics 
and also alteration of this Q angle might not actually predispose patients to patellofemoral arthrosis, but it still, it still remains an important factor, especially if the Q angle is quite high up. Now, tibial tubercle position is also important, which probably is underrated when you start to look into patient with patellofemoral arthrosis. Effect of tibial tubercle abnormality would re result in excessive forces on the patellofemoral joint. And whenever you do surgery where the tibial tubercle is not in right position, which you actually detect by doing what is called as a TTTG ratio, which is the tibial tubercle position vis a vis the femoral condyles, exactly how the TTTG ratio is lying. And if it is not well within the acceptable level, we would understand there is significant correlation between the contact forces and tibial tubercle position. So whenever you do the surgeries of patellofemoral replacement, if the tibial tubercle position is not up to the mark, you might need to add on tibial tubercle osteotomy in all of these cases. So concomitant procedure in form of either an MPFL augmentation or a tibial tubercle realignment procedure might be required so as to restore the kinematics of joint arthroplasty. Patient needs to be looked holistically. Lower limb malalignment is an important factor which also predisposes patients to uh, patellofemoral arthrosis. Varus malalignment induces patellofemoral osteoarthritis and you need to get lower leg scanograms to see for varus malalignment in such cases which are predisposing the patients to a patellofemoral osteoarthritis. We have seen a lot of patients who have got abnormal rotation of the lower limb, especially antiversion of the hip. And these patients walk with an internal rotation gait. So if you have a patient which walks with an internal rotation gait, these patients often load their patellofemoral facets much more there. And in such cases, you have to actually look into lower limb rotation, alignment corrections, rather than going directly into an arthroplasty in such patients which are predisposing to patellofemoral arthritis. And with this kinematic, we have understood that the first generation implant failed. The first generation implant failed because they did not take care of the rotational alignment and rotational alignment was kept parallel to the trochlear line. So patients with maltracking instability and patellar dysplasia would often fail the first generation implant. But over the period of time, and I think Manoj is going to cover all that topic, with the generation, new generation implants coming in, where which are called online implants, which has got a broad trochanteric flange and narrow, which goes more narrow distally, it improves the tracking angle. It improves the congruity. It improves the way the patella moves into the trochlear groove. And I think these kinematic considerations have been kept in mind while designing the second generation implant. But as a clinician, I think it's important for us to understand that kinematics is important. Because once you examine the patient completely, you would understand why does patellofemoral arthrosis happen in this patient on the very first place. And preoperatively, these five things have to be evaluated. The dysplasia, the status of patellar restraints, especially the VMO and MPFL, the position of patella, especially patella alta, the position of tibial tubercle, especially medialization of the tibial tubercle, and lower limb alignment and rotation. I think these five important things are to be looked holistically so as to understand the basic kinematic alteration which is happening in this patient. This would help in design, choosing the right design of the implant to the patient and also to plan concomitant procedures which you would try to do whenever you are doing a patellofemoral arthroplasty. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ipius. So I guess you have set the ball rolling and uh, I always have been seeing purely as a spec to a designer a plant surgeon that, you know, understanding the forces acting on this patellofemoral joint, understanding the kinematics and understanding how your patella has to come back and sit into the trochlea. This is very, very important. If you don't understand where forces are enacting and what you have to do in a patella baha and a patella alta, you would not be able to do that. I just have a one basic point for you, Ibis. Now, you spoke of insal salvati and there is also cat and gestems. Now, when you do an insal salvati, what is the kind of knee flexion you would like to have before you do your calculation of insal salvati ratio or index? What is, what is the type of? Sorry, I couldn't get the question. Of the knee, flexion of the knee. In what degrees of flexion? 
do you do your calculations so i do so, it at 30 degrees 30 degrees of reflection okay because the point to understand it's a, for everybody here is that it's a dynamic movement the moment you go on high bending your values are going to change absolutely so i saw making the this, this kind of a complex topic so simple and for here on uh, dinsha i think you can continue for non arthroplasty joint preservation solutions for patellofemoral joint thank you manoj so i'm going to cover joint preservation solutions for the patellofemoral joint so when you get patellofemoral chondral lesions and arthritis these are basically of three types you could either get post instability post traumatic or degenerative changes in the cartilage and arthritis now john falkerson in 2009 observed that the patellofemoral joint is particularly well suited to preservation given a logical and careful analysis of the mechanical and articular sources of pain and instability followed by precise surgery and early motion it's easily said but it's a difficult joint to treat unlike say the medial compartment of the knee where we know that joint preservation works so well this is a challenging joint for preservation now whenever we get a patient with either chondral lesions or arthritis in the patellofemoral joint basically we've got three options we've got the non operative option we've got joint preservation and we've got arthroplasty and all of our patients really need to start off first with the non operative option you give a trial of non operative treatment and when we say this what do we mean we mean multiple things all together the first and most important is activity modification and adaptations and as ips just mentioned climbing stairs descending stairs doing high impact activities these are going to cause pain so as soon as you stop this i think you can stop a lot of the pain coming in there itself physical therapy again there's a lot of evidence to show that if you do an isometric rehab program for the pfj specifically you can get good results and what does this involve it involves strengthening the quads and vmo strengthening hip abductors and external rotation releasing the tight it band releasing the tight hamstrings and ensuring that you've got a normal gait with high foot eversion so this is all part of physical therapy for patients who've got an acute inflammatory episode you can give them nsaids the role of injections really controversial but again acute inflammatory exacerbations you could give a corticosteroid especially in younger patients visco supplementation maybe some role biologics like prp again for regeneration maybe some role but all of this is controversial bracing and taping short term relief uh, is noted especially if the patients have extend some malalignment associated with arthrosis and weight reduction again would help so all of our patients would undergo first a non operative trial and if this is successful which often it is then i think this is your best option on the other hand patients with severe patellofemoral oa ivano type fours will probably require an arthroplasty and whether this is going to be a surface replacement a pfj or a tkr i think we are going to see in the subsequent lectures but in between these two comes in joint preservation and this is what i will cover so there are a group of patients where non operative treatment is not going to be successful and then not appropriate for arthroplasty and in these we do joint preservation and what really do we do in joint preservation three different things one cartilage restoration your second option is deloading the joint with a tibial tubercle osteotomy or in the rare patient with a lateral facet isolated pain a lateral patella facetectomy so the real question in joint preservation is where is the pain coming in from because we know that the cartilage itself is aneural that's not going to result in pain usually the pain stems from subchondral bone overload and as soon as you've got this subchondral bone overload and you've got cystic changes and bone edema coming in that's where the pain's coming in and if you want to preserve the joint then you need to improve the load bearing capacity of this by either repairing the damaged cartilage so that would mean cartilage restoration so you either do a cartilage restoration and repair the damaged cartilage or you need to do a unloading surgical procedure like a tibial tubercle osteotomy so you unload the patellofemoral joint and this gets you restoration of your joint and in some patients you may require a lateral patella facetectomy especially if there's lateral facet overhang causing lateral impingement so let's see each of these uh, in detail 
The first cartilage restoration. So what are the indications for cartilage restoration? Basically, symptomatic focal articular cartilage defects that have failed non-surgical therapy. And our threshold for surgery usually is lower in traumatic lesions and in younger patients than in older patients with either idiopathic or degenerative lesions. What are our contraindications? We know that a majority of chondral and minor osteochondral lesions in the patella are going to be asymptomatic. And these really should be observed and not treated. So if you've got an ICRS grade one lesion like this, where the cartilage is only probably softened or a little rough, it's not gone through and through. You're getting no subchondral changes here. This needs to be treated non-operatively. This is not an indication for cartilage repair. Similarly, if you've got a patient who's got grade two changes, so you have a break in the cartilage, maybe some mild bone edema, but the cartilage itself is intact. Again, this is not a good case for cartilage restoration. There's nothing much that you're going to do. On the other side of the spectrum, as soon as you've got bipolar kissing lesions and you've got cartilage loss both on the patella and on the uh, femoral trochlea, and these are not good lesions for cartilage restoration. So these really shouldn't undo cartilage repair. And of course, when you've got diffuse OA and diffuse cartilage damage, then this is not a good indication for cartilage restoration. And finally, there's no point in trying to do cartilage restoration if you don't correct the malalignment and the instability, because these are prerequisites for good cartilage uh, repair and durable results. So if you're going to do a cartilage repair and the patient has instability or malalignment, then that needs to be taken care of either at the same stage or at a prior stage. Now, when we talk of cartilage restoration, there are multiple techniques available. And a simple arthroscopic debridement or a chondroplasty is often used as a first line of treatment in many cases, especially in smaller lesions and in older patients with more degenerative lesions. On the other hand, for our younger patients who don't have degeneration and who have basically focal cartilage defects, you need to do something better. You need to make sure that you've got a good, stable, cartilaginous repair. And for this, the easiest technique is a bone marrow stimulation. So in a bone marrow stimulation, what do you do? You take out all the cartilage loose pieces, you go right down to subchondral bone, and you make multiple puncture holes in the bone. From this, the blood clot is going to come out. It's called the super clot. This contains the mesenchym and stem cells. And then this forms a tough fibrocartilaginous repair. This is an extremely inexpensive sort of repair option, but unfortunately may not be so durable because it's not high line like cartilage. On the other hand, if you get an isolated lesion while you're doing say an MPFL reconstruction, and that's right there in the middle of the cartilaginous facet there, you may want to do a oats, or oats or a mosaic plastic, which is an osteoarticular uh, autographed transplant. So you take a peg from the uh, opposite uh, trochlea, then this is a 10 mm peg that you then put in press fit. And you'll see that when you put a single peg in, because this subchondral bone is going to heal, one year down the line, you've got a good high line cartilage restoration of the patella. But again, this is for focal lesions, and you shouldn't really put in more than one peg because more than one peg really doesn't have good results as far as the patella is concerned. When you've got larger lesions, you may want to do an autologous chondrocyte implantation especially when you've got a larger lesion which affects this part of the central ridge. This is difficult to reconstruct with any of the other techniques. So when you've got a lesion like this, you're going to have to debreed it and then do an autologous chondrocyte implantation. And this is a fourth generation uh, fibrin ACI with which you can restore that ridge really well. This ridge is important because when this heals, this is going to allow proper tracking and will prevent further degeneration. And when you do the one-year MRI in these patients, you'll note that that's the ACI that's healed in there. This is now highline rich cartilage, and this has restored that three-dimensional anatomy of that ridge, which is critical for this patient. And finally, for very large lesions like this, an AVN of the trochlea might have to resort to an osteochondral allograft, a transplant, because this is a three-dimensional reconstruction that you require, and you're not going to get this three-dimensional contour restored anatomy without and allograft. So this is a fresh osteochondral allograft. And you can see that we fix these in the countersunk Robert screws. Now, we've seen the cartilage restoration procedures, but these are often done in isolated chondral lesions. 
when you've got early patellofemoral OA, or when you've got a lesion that you want to offload, tibial typical osteotomy with antromedialization is really a good option. So when you do a tibial tubercle antromedial transfer, this offloads the lateral patella facet. And by offloading the lateral patella facet, you're going to slow down the changes of degeneration. Also, what happens here is that the patella engages earlier in flexion and therefore is going to offload the damaged distal articular cartilage. And this is important in specific groups. So what are the indications for these tibial tubercle osteotomies? Well, basically, you've got two distinct indications, but often these are overlapping. You've got first patients who've got patellofemoral instability with a TTTG more than 20 mm. So then you're going to require a distal realignment. Otherwise, your MPFL is going to fail. So you'll do a tibial tubercle antromedialization. But it's also useful for offloading the joint when your patient's got chondral changes and you want to make sure that the patient gets less pain. So how are you going to do this unloading? You're going to do an antromedialization of the tibial tuberosity. But typically in this, this is done for areas of uh, in the lateral facet. How much do you do? Well, the degree of anteriorization, distalization, or medialization really depends on the extent of arthrosis of both the lateral facet and patella alta. So if there's patella alta, you want to do a distalization. If there's no patella alta, you want to do an antromedialization. But you have to be careful because any associated medial facet or proximal patella chondrosis is going to cause uh, problems. It's contraindication because you're potentially going to overload this area that has already undergone degeneration. So when you look at the different sort of patterns of chondral degeneration, patellar instability, classically you land up with degeneration on the medial facet, whereas it's maltracking where you'll have it on the lateral facet or a valgus knee where you'll have it on the lateral facet. So these are the two real indications for tibial tubercle osteotomy. When you've got maltracking with lateral facet arthrosis, I think that's the great indication because you'll offload the lateral facet with an antromedialization. You could also probably do it for patellar instability with a medial or a distal one, but you need to be sure that you don't over-medialize your mid-tubercle osteotomy. When you've got proximal arthrosis, as you would with direct trauma or with repetitive microtrauma, or you'll get trochlear changes, this certainly is not a good indication for TTO, and nor is the varus knee. As the varus knee, not a good indication, because when you do a tibial tubercle transfer, remember that you're affecting joint loading, not just within the patellofemoral joint, but also the tibiofemoral joint. If you over-medialize the tibial tubercle more than 15 millimeters past the original site, then you know that you're going to start landing up with increased load in the medial compartment. And so if you've got a varus knee or you've got degenerative changes in the medial compartment of the joint, or you've got a patient who's undergone a partial medial meniscectomy, then be very careful. Don't use a TPO. Finally, lateral patella facetectomy. When should we be doing this? Well, we know that 89% of all isolated patellofemoral OA cases initially involve the lateral facet of the patella. And as the joint space narrows progressively, the lateral facet starts remolding into a concave shape. It starts impinging at the lateral trochlea. And then these patients will start getting lateral soft tissue fibrosis retinacular fibrosis, shortening of the retinaculum, cartilage damage, and then this will progress to the rest of the joint and become bipolar patellofemoral OA. So if we could catch these patients early and excise the lateral 15 mm of the lateral facet, then this will relieve the soft tissue impingement from the osteophyte and effectively lengthen the lateral retinaculum. So I think this is an important sort of option, especially if you catch the patients early. This will reduce the lateral pressure and will give rise to pain relief. You may also want to do a lateral retinacular lengthening. We know that lateral retinacular release in today's day and age is out because it causes many other problems, but a lengthening concomitantly done with a lateral patella facetectomy will be good in case you can't get your patella back in position. So what are the indications for this? Well, it's indicated for retract, refractory anterolateral knee pain, with isolated lateral patella, uh, patellofemoral OA. And when you've got a lateral patella osteophyte that's impinging on the lateral facet, I think then again, this is a good indication. The relative contraindications, of course, uh, if you've got a 
generalized degeneration, you've gone into an Ivano 3, 4, or you've gone into in, uh, a tricompartmental degenerative disease, then of course, this is going to be of no use at all. In our practice with our younger patients, we tend to see this more with patients who have bipartite or tripartite patellae. And we seem to be doing this procedure more for these sort of patients. So when you've got a bipartite patella in a young athlete such as this, and this is causing lateral facet impingement, then this is again a good indication for a facetectomy. And you start first by doing the arthroscopy, you note where the overhang and the impingement is of the lateral facet. And then once you've done that, especially if you're gonna do a lateral retinacular lengthening as in this patient, because he's not centralized well, his patella is not centralized well, then you open it, excise that fragment, do your lateral retinacular lengthening, and that will achieve the required pain relief that this patient would uh, require. On the other hand, if you've got a patient like this with a tripartite where the patella is well-centered and there's impingement of that lateral facet, then in this situation, you could actually do this just arthroscopically. So arthroscopically, again, that's the patella. You can see the junction here. That's where the lateral overhang is. And when you take these patients into flexion, you'll see the impingement there. So this, you could actually use your radio frequency and come down and do it arthroscopically itself and get this entire fragment out because you really don't need to do anything to that uh, lateral retinacular. So finally, what are the outcomes that we've seen with uh, joint uh, preservation? So with joint preservation, the outcomes are relatively good, but probably not as good as the medial compartment. If we look at cartilage restoration, cartilage restoration in the patella and in the trochlea has inferior results to the medial weight-bearing part of the MFC, the medial femoral condyle, but it can be effective if performed along with the tibial tubercle osteotomy. And in uh, Jack Farr's series, ACI for grade three and four patellofemoral chondral lesions, concomitant antromedialized uh, tibial tubercle osteotomies, 75% good to excellent outcomes on lysome score. And when he compared this with another series without the osteotomy, he found that the ACI did not have such good outcomes. On the other hand, what about osteotomies alone? Typically, these give you good results if done for the correct indications. And the longevity in one series was up to almost 108 months of survivorship. Remember that the outcomes are dependent on the location of the cartilage damage. So if this is in the distal or lateral part of the facet, then you're going to get great results. But if it's on the medial facet, these results really start falling down 20%. And finally, the largest series on lateral patella facetectomy, 87 cases for isolated patellofemoral lateral OA with a mean follow-up of 9.6 years. Uh, only 23 of these cases were failures, which then went on for TKA and the mean survival time was 13.6 years. So it is a good procedure for the correct indication. So as we've seen, the three options that we have for joint preservation, which is cartilage restoration, tibial tubercle osteotomy, and lateral uh, uh, patella acetectomy, I think these are good options, and these are good options, but this joint is a particularly difficult joint to treat, primarily because of all the anatomic characteristics, because of all the biomechanics that come into it, and because of the interplay of soft tissues too. It's a good option for patients who fail non-operative treatment, but who are not appropriate for arthroplasty. Thank you. Thanks, Simsha. I think it's a nice education for all of us to get ourselves wrapped up on cartilage restoration, uh, offloading procedures and lateral facetectomy. Now, uh, rolling this on, we'll move on to the real arthroplasty options for patellofemoral joint. And uh, for this, as Dr. Mahanti said, we have Dr. David Rovinsky, but since it's 4 a.m. in Hawaii, he requested me to play his video and he will join us around half an hour later in the discussion. Before we move forward, we need to understand a bit about patellofemoral joint because that's a not a common facet that majority of the younger surgeons would have seen. So we will take you through the indications, the contraindications, the type onlay and the inlay, the surgical technique. As IPS and Dr. Dinshad told you, 
If you have a maltracking, then you require a PFJ with concomitant procedures. That means a tibial tubercle osteotomy. The results and complications. Where is a placement for emerging technologies like robotics and the computer navigation? And what do you do in a PFJ OA with dysplasia? But before we start on the video, since you have not, majority of youngsters have not seen, this is how uh, Patrol Hamaru joined. This is Zarni uh, PFJ, but uh, multiple companies uh, selling this through. Now, there are basically two kinds of uh, PFJ trochlear implants. First is symmetric, that means right and left common, and second is asymmetric. This is an asymmetric left side. So here, the features to understand is they have two categories, the onlay and the inlay. In inlay, you just scrape off the cartilage and put up an implant on the subchondral plate, but you cannot play across with the pre-existing anatomy or the shape of the trochlea. If you have some sort of a malalignment or dysplasia, you're going to have a failure. The current implants today are more of an only, this is an only implant. On the implant, the trochlear cut is the same as you do in a total knee replacement. You cut on, you have this, which is the lateral riser. You have a petla which comes in, in a baha you want extended this flange so that in extension also the seating is and the capture is there in the trochlea, it goes down. When it goes distally, you have this tip. The tip has to be proximal to the ACL so that it does not impinge in the notch on the ACL. Along with that, as Dr. IPS told you, in extreme amounts of flexion, your patella is going to slide across this S-shaped curve beyond 90 degrees and articulate with the medial and lateral articular surfaces. So you would want a smooth transition from the metal to the cartilage. So your trochlea has to have an inherent valgus. It should be asymmetric. Majority of these new generation implants are only ones. We'll see on the video. Also with that, you have to have a smooth transition proximally for capturing the distal end of the petla and the distal end where you articulate with the proximal end of the petla. Similarly, your patellas that move through, we will discuss in our talk, but since I'm holding the implants right now, this is the inlay, biconvex patella. Majority in India, we don't use this inlay implant. We use the more of an onlay kinds, the round or the oval with three pegs or one peg. We will take it through our talk. Now I'll play on uh, the presentation from Dr. David Rovinsky, since we have done our foundation baseline now. Good afternoon, it's Dr. David Robinski from University of Hawaii, and I am talking about patellofemoral arthroplasty. And I appreciate your understanding given the time difference requiring this recording. I am a consultant for Smith Nephew, OrthoGrid, and also BR. And this will be a broad ranging talk on patellofemoral arthroplasty, going from indications to alternative procedures. And then we'll talk about patellofemoral arthroplasty design, manual and robotic techniques, and when to transition from patellofemoral arthroplasty to a total knee. So the major cause of patellofemoral arthritis are increased patellofemoral joint stresses. And the most common causes would be dysplasia, patellofemoral malalignment, valgus alignment, femoral antiversion. And all these are much more common in women than in men. And this is why the demographics of this operation trend towards female patients. Patients of a high BMI have also increased patellofemoral stresses. And of course, prior trauma with an irregular joint surface is an issue. And we've also seen this in patients that have prior ACL reconstruction. So the best indication for patellofemoral arthroplasty is of course, trochlear dysplasia and osteoarthritis of the patellofemoral articulation. You can correct some maltracking issues such as tilt and subluxation with a patellofemoral arthroplasty but if you have true patellofemoral instability, you have to think about adding accessory procedures or perhaps converting to a total knee. And the contraindications are, of course, patients who have tibiofemoral arthritis or large patellofemoral malalignment. So we look at the Q angle in men if it's greater than 15 or if women is greater than 20, then you have to think about doing a tubercle osteotomy. Large varus or valgus deformities also are problematic and they have to have a stable knee with a good range of motion. 
you have to be very careful when you're doing this in patients who have a higher BMI because of the risk of failure. And Patella Baja and Patella Alta present specific challenges, and I'll address them a little bit later. Trochlear osteotomy has been proposed as a solution for trochlear dysplasia and patella maltracking, and there are some series that show excellent success of stability. But almost half of these patients require an additional procedure, such as a tubercle osteotomy, and a third are left with residual pain. And for this reason, we have abandoned the use of this procedure at our institution. MPFL reconstruction, reconstruction of the medial patellofemoral ligament is an excellent choice for traumatic dislocations and really prevents recurrent instability. And I'll combine this with a arthroscopy so I can look at chondral lesions that often occur at the time of dislocation of the patella, but I rarely use these for late or arthritic type reconstructive procedures. Typically, tubercle osteotomies are sometimes necessary to control patella instability. And there were complications associated with soft tissue issues with the McKay procedure. The Fulkerson accomplishes two things by anteriorizing and medializing the tibial tubercle. And this is a very successful operation with excellent results and follow-up. And this is really necessary sometimes as an adjunctive procedure to correct patella tracking. Don't forget the osteochondral autograft or osteochondral allograft to address unipolar lesions either on the patella or on the trochlear surface. This will be very helpful in getting some more time out of that patellofemoral joint in the younger patient. Patellofemoral arthroplasty has a long history and initial components tended to be of the inlay design and modern components are more of the onlay design. And the inlay design, the concept behind it was to deepen the trochlea in patients with trochlea dysplasia, but you're forced to follow the anatomy of the knee, more so than with the onlay component, which allows you to adjust the rotation. And you can see that here in this picture, the inlay component can force you to place your tibial, uh, your femoral component into an internally rotated position, and that will hurt your patella tracking. With the onlay component, I can put the component in the rotation I choose, to improve the patella tracking. They also tend to be wider, so they're more forgiving. The patella component, many variations. One concept is we wanna optimize coverage, and this has attracted the surgeons to an oval type design versus a round resurfacing design. Of course, the inlay design leaves the most amount of material uncovered, both medially and laterally. Fixation has been with cement with great success, although we're seeing excellent results with these ingrowth type patella components, and we'll discuss that later. Complications are either early or late. So instability can be a problem and it's related to implant design sometimes. So this was a very narrow trochlea inset or inlay design component and has a very narrow ability to keep the patella in line. And this was revised to an onlay type, which was broader and more forgiving. And in this case, the component was put in too much flexion and overstuffed the patella femoral joint, which led to peripatellar pain because of stress on the soft tissues. So this was a revised to a onlay component and improved tracking and the symptoms. Late complications are generally development of tibiofemoral arthritis, which is anywhere from 20 to 25%. Loosening is very uncommon. So long-term outcomes, very mixed results, mostly because these are rare operations. So the series tend to be small and the outcomes are very implant related. So you'll have much higher rates of revision in an inlay type prosthesis, for example. But if you have a good patient selection and a good implant, you can expect 60 to 70% 20 year survival at least. Modern components, onlay type have had excellent outcomes, better function than a total knee, similar reoperation and revision rates to a total knee with 80 to 95% satisfactory results with 96% survival at five years. So preoperative evaluation, I think is the key. Patient selection is the key to success. In my mind, an MRI is necessary because it lets us really look at the patellofemoral joint anatomy and look at the tibiofemoral joint and see if there are any lesions there that may lead to problems down the road because that's a cause of late failure. I'm mindful of patella tracking issues and soft tissue imbalance. And I wanna think about if they have tight lateral tissues, am I gonna do a recession of the lateral capsule, resect that lateral facet to offload the lateral capsular tensions. Surgical approach, medial parapetella is the most common. 
I prefer a subvastus approach and I do not apply a tourniquet. I really don't want to do any injury to that VMO, which is critical dynamic stabilizer of the knee. I make a blue mark on the capsule and that helps me repair that medial capsule anatomically. I do not use a lateral patellar approach. I think it's very difficult to control the tension on the lateral side in your closure and the tissue is lesser quality on the lateral side than the medial side. So I don't feel I get a good water type closure. Patella measurements, the first step once we do our exposure and remember this patella is abnormally thick because it's arthritic. So we're not trying to reproduce that thickness. I'm really thinking about how thin is that patella because I want to leave at least 12 millimeters of bone to reduce my risk of fracture. And I think about my patella implant choices our normal implant is nine millimeters. Our thin implant is seven and a half millimeters. The average thickness of the patella is anywhere from 23 to 26 millimeters. So I wanna leave at least 15 to 17 millimeters behind after I've done my patella resection so I have good bone stuff. Patella resection implants and instruments, there are lots of them out there. I've never had success using them consistently. I always have to recut the patella by hand. So I just use a manual freehand technique and I don't use an inset patella. Again, I've not had great success with these implants or these instruments over the last 20 years. So I use a freehand technique with towel clips. I use the saw to make my resection from proximal to distal at the level of the quadricep insertion. I use a round resurfacing patella component with multiple lug holes. If the bone is fluorotic, I'll drill some holes to augment cement fixation. I'll do a recession of that lateral capsule to ease up those tight tissue tensions, but I do not do a lateral release. I do not like leaving that lateral capsule open. I'll medialize the patella location with a round resurfacing component, and then I'll resect that lateral facet, again, to decompress those tight lateral tissues. When we expose the femur, I look at the femur surface, and I look at the tibiofemoral surface to make sure there's no pre-arthritic lesions that I have to worry about. Then I'll draw in white size line with ink and I'll draw two lines parallel to it. And this will help me set up my rotation alignment later in the case. And you have to be mindful of putting the rotation of the femoral component where you want to, similar to a total knee, adding external rotation, particularly if there's a hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle. So we use an intramedullary guide similar to a total knee. We put this in just above the notch. And this will set our varus valgus and put your femoral component in three or four degrees of flexion. Femoral component rotation, I use my white sides line and I can see those landmarks and set the rotation and pin the guide in place. You can also flex the knee to 90 degrees and use your tibia to help with your rotational alignment of your femoral component. I set the anterior resection depth just like a total knee. I want my on leg component to lie right on that anterior femoral cortex. So I'm using my feeler gauge on that anterolateral ridge, just medial to it. And then I wanna see that nice grand piano sign when I've done my anterior femoral cut. In this case, we have a drill guide that works as a sizing guide. So we want the largest component without medial lateral overhang. And now I'm gonna mark carefully that transition zone in the base of the notch. And we apply a reamer guide to remove the bone where the implant goes. And this transition point is really important because if you have your component too proud or too deep, you're gonna have clicking and catching as you go in and out of flexion. So you have to match the level of the implant to the level of the cartilage. And you ream the trochlea with this milling tool and then you can apply an implant trial to make sure you've got your depth. And if you don't like it, you can always remove a little extra bone. So I do this often in multiple steps. Then we apply our drill guide and drill the lug holes. There are four holes for this component. And these are offset from the surface to improve fixation. So you have to roll that component in place. And then with my trial patella and femoral component in place, I range the knee. And this is my final check for patella maltracking and see what's happening as you're clicking and catching as we roll in and out of flexion at the trochlea. So this is where you have trouble with patella alta and patella baja because the location of the patella relative to the joint line is altered. And it's impossible in some of these cases to get a smooth transition. And I don't hesitate at this point to abandon the patellofemoral arthroplasty and transition to a total knee. Then we cement and close, again, being mindful of our landmarks medially for an anatomic repair of that medial capsule. So the challenges of manual instrumentation is femoral component alignment and position. And really, 
challenging to get that transition zone accurately without some trial and error. So this has caused me to transition to robotic assisted surgery. I use the Cori system for all my total knees and all my partial knees. So it's a three dimensional mapping of the distal femur and the tibia. So we can reproduce the anatomy of the knee. We incorporate ligament tension for gap balancing and I have flexibility of transitioning from a uni to a total as needed. And it's truly a combination of computer aided design and CNC machining with a handheld milling tool. So the accuracy of the system has been shown in the lab less than one millimeter accuracy. So what you plan is what you get. So you have a very accurate tool to help you with planning as well as execution of that plan. So this is one of our ICU nurses and he's complaining of patellofemoral pain and I've done arthroscopy of his knee. So I've seen what the cartilage surface looked like. And very often these x-rays underestimate the amount of arthritis that is present. The MRI really does show us the degree of patellofemoral arthrosis and gives us a look at the tibiofemoral articulation and we can see that that's in good shape. At the time of surgery, we can see he has exposed bone on the patella and on the femoral side. And with our tool, we map the center of the femoral head. We also map the surface of the distal femur. And with this information, we can virtually place our femoral component exactly where we would like to see it. And we can set the femoral component right on that anterior cortex. We can adjust the rotation, which is in line with his AP axis of his femur. And we can also look at that transition zone very carefully. So if we like what we're seeing on this view in the bottom right, that's what our post-operative x-rays will look like. We can be sure that we're not overstuffing the joint. And we have this virtual CT as well, again, to see the relationship of the rotation of the native anatomy versus our planned component. We have a handheld milling tool, which removes the bone where the implant goes. So it's just simply removing the bone with a mill. And you can see in the top right corner that the mill will withdraw to the sleeve if we color outside the lines. So this is a very efficient, less than a minute to prepare the bone in most cases, including the lug holes. This is our final bone preparation. You can see that we've been mindful of our transition zone and we can exactly match the level of the cartilage surface. We cement in our implants and we can verify our patella tracking which we like, and then we close the capsule, and this is our result. And you can see that we've restored some depth through his trochlea, and the patella is tracking beautifully. So with robotics, you have an easier ability to add a uni to a PFJ, and this is certainly the topic of one of our upcoming lectures, but I think it's a great option. And the choice sometimes comes down to when do you do a patella femoral arthroplasty, when do you do a total knee replacement? And in general, it's a functional question. I don't look at age, but I look at what the patient's looking to do because the functional outcomes with patellofemoral arthroplasty are so good. But for older patients, a total knee arthroplasty gives excellent results. So if you're doing a total knee replacement on someone who has patellofemoral arthritis, often you're dealing with maltracking issues and traditional implants make this even harder. So this is an insult bursting one design and every implant on the market is a variation of this as a flat, joint line, a symmetric femur, same shape medially and laterally. And the femur was placed by insole posteriorly to enable flexion. So this was a concession to engineering over anatomy to enable the knees to bend better. But what this does is it puts your quadriceps at a disadvantage. And we know the quadriceps are very important for quadricep control and also as a dynamic stabilizer of the patellofemoral joint. The other issue is that Conventional total knees do not rotate as they bend. So we have to really build in a lot of external rotation to our components to help the patella tracking. So you're putting the components in non-anatomic positions to fix a non-anatomic design. So we have to be mindful of putting the femoral component in appropriate external rotation, as well as the tibia component. And if you think about this, if you put the tibia component in too much internal rotation, it has the effect of lateralizing your tibial tubercle. So this really is gonna hurt your patella tracking. So if you reimagine the total knee as a resurfacing procedure, which is what has been done with the Journey 2 implant, my goal is to restore the knee's pre-arthritic joint shape and alignment. And this family of implants includes patellofemoral arthroplasty, unique compartmental arthroplasty, 
bicruciate sparing knee designs, as well as a bicruciate substituting design. And the femur matches the normal anatomic contours, so it has a larger radius of curvature and a thicker implant medially, and a smaller radius of curvature and a thinner implant laterally. And the tibia is also thinner medially and thicker laterally, and it's concave medially and convex laterally, which helps drive normal anatomic function. So the consequence of this is that we have a knee where the femur is sitting anterior, sitting directly over the tibia, just like a normal knee. So this gives your quadriceps a great advantage. And then the design of the implant encourages posterior lateral rotation as you go into flexion. And you can see how this really, really helps your patellofemoral tracking. And this is the main reason why I haven't done a lateral release in many, many years, because the implant facilitates rather than fights my patellofemoral tracking. So in this case of a 68-year-old female who has very severe patellofemoral disease and a patella tilt, we can do a nice job with a total knee with her and get her patella tracking right down the middle. A younger patient, this is a harder question, 47 years old, he's a big fellow, he loves playing basketball, and he has a prior history of a patella dislocation and contain, complains of anterior knee pain and instability. And you can see he's got severe patellofemoral arthritis, patella tilt, and trochlear dysplasia. So you can see why he has had in the past patella dislocation. But he also has some degree of tibiofemoral arthrosis. And this is a complicated problem to deal with. And he's beyond what I would do a patellofemoral arthroplasty. So we have an implant, the Journey 2 XR, which is a bicruciate sparing knee. It really is a total knee resurfacing that spares all the implants. And we're relying on the ligaments the ACL, PCL to work together to drive that rotation as you go into flexion. And you can see how this, again, aids the patellofemoral tracking. So we have a three-dimensional map of the femur and the tibia. We map out the ACL footprint. We put the implants in the ideal position to, again, restore pre-arthritic anatomy. We can gather information about the MCL and LCL for gap balancing. We can virtually place our components again, to reproduce normal anatomy and ligament function. And now we have a plan. We use our milling tool to remove the bone where the implant goes. And this is a very conservative procedure. As you will see, we're preserving the ACL footprint and the implant is designed to fit around the ACL PCL. Intraoperatively, easy range of motion. Postoperatively, you can see, again, the femur sitting anteriorly where we want it. We've restored the oblique joint line and very minimal bone resection for a total knee replacement with excellent patella tracking. This is him going home the same day of surgery, and at four weeks, he's walking quite comfortably. So when we think about patellofemoral arthroplasty, patient selection is the key to success. I think that you have to be mindful what you can fix and what you can't fix with patellofemoral arthroplasty. So instability has to be addressed with additional procedures like a tubercle osteotomy. A preoperative MRI is helpful in looking at tibiofemoral arthrosis and avoiding revision surgery in the future. On late femoral component, round resurfacing, patella component, these have the best track record. And using robotic assistance with computer aided design and CNC machining gives us very reproducible results. And please just do a normal approach that you would for total knee and be prepared for plan B. You want to be able to convert to a good total knee replacement if needed, and don't hesitate uh, if that's necessary. You want to do the best operation you can for the patient. So thank you very much for your attention. Mahalo nui loa, and I look forward to connecting with you in the question and answer portion. Yeah, so... Manus, can you stop sharing the screen? Stop sharing this. We welcome David. Uh, David, thank you very much for joining uh, you know, early morning. <laughs> <laughs> so, welcome to the webinar. Uh, that was a you know, fantastic uh, lecture there. Can I have some discussion? Can I ask you some questions? Of course. Um, uh, in every case, do you do a, you know, arthroscopy to confirm the patellofemoral arthrosis or uh, 
you do an MRI to confirm or uh, it is just a radiology? We're fortunate that we have access to an MRI machine. So an MRI is a part of my workup every time. If I did not have arthroscopy available, then I would consider an arthroscopy first. But the other option is, since I do a standard subvastus approach for every knee, I have a chance to directly inspect the tibiofemoral articulation. So you could have both implants available if you didn't have an MRI handy preoperatively. Okay. And uh, my next question is, how do you, you know, correct the patella baha um, or patella alta while doing a patella femoral orthoplasty? The challenge is you cannot correct patella alta or patella baja with patella femoral arthroplasty because the joint line is set. And those are the cases where the angle of attack of the patella is going to be changed. And you sometimes, no matter what you do, you cannot get that articulation to be smooth at that transition zone. So if you look again at the um, total knee case more closely, you'll see the lady who had the very bad patella femoral disease that I used the total knee on. She had patella alta. So in her case, that was another reason why we opted for total knee because we put a complete femoral implant. We could elevate her joint line intentionally using the robotic assisted system. And that helped us correct the angle of attack of the patella and improved her tracking. Uh, would, you, would you permit a last question? Yeah, yeah. So David, do you always use an onlay uh, trochlea or are there certain indications where you would go with an inlay design also? I am pretty much a creature of habit. So if I have success with one implant system, the onlay system works well for me. So I always use an onlay system. Um, I think it's, it gives me the ability to put the rotation exactly where I want it. And, and I can choose my external rotation. I can add external rotation much more easily than an inlay component. So um, because that's been a good success for me and the more recent designs with a better track record have been the onlay, I just stick with what appears to work. Wonderful. So Dr. Monty, you want me to start the next talk? Yeah, you can uh, start in the meantime. Uh, one last question to David. Uh, you know, uh, Richard Scott, what recommended that uh, you, while closing the, you know, cordyceps tendon, that uh, you distalize the medial part and uh, proximalize the lateral part of the tendon in order to correct the patella baha to some extent. Would you recommend in patella femoral arthroplasty that kind of closure? I think that I'm pretty conservative with what I can and cannot correct. So the patella baja, the challenges are not only the angle of attack, but those are very, very tight knees. So there's increased pressures at the patella femoral articulation. So as I indicated in the lecture, I make a mark where my capsule is on the way in so I can reproduce exactly that capsular closure. So I don't tend to advance the capsule. I wanna close it in an anatomic fashion. And I want that patella to track smoothly and easily without anything touching the capsule. So I don't use a towel clip or a thumb. I want the patella to track smoothly. So if I can't get it to work with my trials in place then I, I don't hesitate in the patella baja case to convert to a total knee because I think that's gonna be a more reliable procedure. Thank you. So thank, thank you, Manu. Uh, yeah. We can proceed with that. And uh, before I end off, thanks, David, for we are privileged to have you early morning. Now, since you are up, so we would request you to be around for our panel discussion also. We will be privileged to have your questions. The next on the league is uh, compartmental orthoplasty of the knee from Dr. Martin Reddish from Tennessee, uh, where he's going to discuss about the combination of medial lateral or medial with PFJ and what are the indications in special situations. Compartmental arthroplasty of the knee, alternative to total knee arthroplasty.
With regard to my disclosures, I'm a paid surgical consultant for Max Orthopedics. I receive no royalties from any surgical product. Like patellofemoral arthroplasty, unicondylar arthroplasty resurfaces as one of the three compartments of the knee, containing the non-disease compartments and the cruciate ligaments. The literature shows a good UKA gives a better functional result than that of a total knee. But after 40 years of publications, the results are mixed long-term. And they're often a result of surgeon experience, surgical technique, and component design. Unicondylar designs can be divided into fixed and mobile bearing, resurfacing, and resection. Video components can be all polyethylene, either inlay or onlay, or modular metal backed, mobile or fixed. Femoral components are thick and chamfered with two pegs for resection or thin with one peg and a keel for resurfacing. I have found that a resurfacing unicondylar is more minimally invasive to both soft tissue and bone, which translates to a faster recovery and broadens the indications for its use. This thin curved femoral component with one peg and a keel will accurately resurface the femoral condyle and lends itself well to a minimally invasive incision. The inlaid component rests superficially on good hard subchondral arthritic bone. The modular onlay goes much deeper and sacrifices this hard cancellous bone to sit on cortex. Pictures on the right show how much bone is left after removal of these components. There is a significant difference as you see. A resurfacing unicolor can be revised to a primary total knee or a resection unicondylar, whereas a resection unicondylar with a greater amount of bone loss can only be revised by revision total knee replacement with stems and or augments. Let's review some of the important points that unicondylar enthusiasts such as myself have learned. First, we try to reestablish the patient's pre-disease alignment. In medial uni, this is typically zero to three degrees varus. Overstuffing into valgus has been shown to cause progression of disease. A resurfacing uni preserves the original joint line reference points so that the surgeon can easily visualize how many millimeters to add to make up for the worn articular cartilage. A resection uni requires sawing off the joint surfaces of both femur and tibia, thus losing those reference points. So the surgeon must determine alignment by use of spacer blocks and arbitrary judgments of ligamentous laxity. A resurfacing uni utilizes a short muscle sparing incision with no capsular releases. By not cutting the quads and dislocating the patella, a speedy recovery is made without the need for formal physical therapy. We obsess about balancing the flexion gap in total knees, but with a unicondylar with intact cruciates, too much flexion gap has never been shown to be a problem. The entire posterior medial femoral condyle was resected and used as a graft in this German study, and these athletic patients exhibited no clinical instability. By utilizing an improvised pulse lavage system, we can thoroughly clean out all marrow contents from the cancellous bone in the tibial pocket, greatly increasing cement penetration for increased support and resistance to loosening. This elegant study beautifully illustrates that point. This study correlates central positioning of the femoral component relative to the tibial component with superior clinical results. The system I use incorporates a novel mechanism that achieves this centralization. Now let's look at some x-rays. The first is a garden variety medial arthrosis. The lateral side looks perfectly good. Postoperatively in the middle picture, 
The inlaid polyethylene is nice and flat on the coronal view. The cement is penetrated very nicely. It covers the vast majority of the medial tibial plateau. And on the right, that lateral view follows the patient's contours beautifully, which is easy to do with an inlay since we just follow the natural slope of the patient. Here's an elderly male with a 16 degree varus deformity with a lot of bony deformity of the tibial plateau that was corrected nicely, most likely to his pre-morbid anatomy. This next patient demonstrates that even with a lot of varus and subluxation, if the stress view shows that it can be corrected, then a unicondler can be an excellent option for that patient. The literature tells us that a lateral unicondler is as good or better of an operation as a median. Although the technique is more difficult, some of the patella has to be removed for access. This young factory worker had a severe deformity of his lateral tibial plateau that was nicely corrected by this lateral unit. This 84-year-old lady refused to have a total knee replacement and insisted on a unicondylar. And I was happy to be able to get a great result with her using a thicker polyethylene component. In this frail elderly woman, using a resurfacing uni turned a difficult stage reconstruction into an easy outpatient procedure from which she made a rapid recovery. In the last three years, I have treated disease progression by resurfacing the other weight-bearing compartment. I have found this to be a much better treatment than conversion to total knee replacement. A quick, safe recovery and a better end result. I recognized this 70-year-old man when he came in the office as the first patient I ever did a resurfacing unicondylar on. I was pleased to see that he was here about his other knee. You see the x-ray on the left. I timidly asked how his previously operated knee was, and he told me he had never had a problem with it and consented to have an x-ray. You see it on the right 20 years later. Who knows how durable these can be? But this certainly was encouraging. My intermediate results on 344 consecutive patients were peer-reviewed and published in 2017. We took on all comers with little prejudice as to age or BMI. Forgotten joint and Oxford scores ranked good to excellent. Kaplan-Meier survival was 94.6% in 10 years, which is 0.54% per year, far below the standard of 1% per year set by NICE guidelines. The use of patellofemoral arthroplasty staged with unicondylar in patients with progression of osteoarthritis to a second compartment is a viable option for avoiding revision to a total knee. Lonner and Argentson have reported that due to favorable implant designs and improved surgical techniques, combining PFA with either medial or lateral UKA can yield good results, thus avoiding the risk and trauma of revision total knee arthritis. Using PFA with UKA can be performed to avoid conversion to a total knee after progression of OA. There's less risk to the patient than a total knee. In young patients, it's good for preserving soft tissues and bone. And in elderly patients, it's good when they have multiple severe comorbidities. Just remember to avoid component kissing or overlap. While there is a paucity of literature on patellofemoral arthroplasty in combination with UKA, there are a few small series published with excellent outcomes. Argentson reported restoration of knee function and relief of pain in 17 patients with unlinked PFA matched with UKA. 
In addition, HIC reported 100% survivorship in nine patients at 12 years. And KMETH reported improvement in 21 patients at two year follow up. This 68 year old male with grade four patellofemoral degeneration presented with high expectations for hiking through difficult mountainous terrain. To preserve his stability through retention of his ACL and intact lateral compartment, we decided on this modular bicompartmental arthroplasty as an alternative to total knee replacement. About 50% of patients go to surgery with unicompartmental osteoarthritis. However, 95% of them receive total knees worldwide. Therefore, each year, 1.2 million knees have a healthy ACL and two non-arthritic <laughs> sacrificed for the finality of total knee arthroplasty. I think we all see the attraction of compartmental arthroplasty, but there are legitimate reasons that most surgeons do very few. Many arthroplasty surgeons are never trained in unicondros in residency or fellowship. And the techniques are poorly taught by companies who are not really incentivized to sell a less expensive implant. A well-meaning surgeon is likely to have trouble getting through the learning curve. They may fear compromising a possible future total need that no one would have criticized them for doing to begin with. After 21 years of experience doing unis and working with several companies, to develop implants, it's obvious that I favor the resurfacing inlay. I hope no matter what type of compartmental device you use, you will stick with it. With the help of Max Orthopedics and utilizing new cutting guides, power burrs, and rasps, we hope to start another wave of enthusiasm for compartmental arthroplasty. If the surgeon knows they're doing no harm, they're more likely to try and do what's best for the patient, in my opinion. Thank you for your attention. I think, Dr. Manti, this was uh, one of his presentations on compartmental stuff. Yes, we all in India mostly do uh, resection uni, but this is the way resurfacing uni is done, especially with the kinematic alignment in our protocol. And uh, if you permit, I will start with my talk is the next on tricks and pearls of patellar resurfacing in total knee arthroplasty. Yeah, yeah, Manoj, go ahead. Uh, yeah. We thank Martin for that uh, lecture uh, and uh, for giving the recording of the lecture. Thank you, Martin. Is, yeah, my, Manoj, screen please go ahead. is my screen visible? Yeah, we are visible and audible. Good. So an ideal patellar resurfacing is very important for fundamentally having good outcomes after total knee arthroplasty. Doing the same surgery for more than 20 years now, a couple of thousands across on either ways not or doing resurfacing. So I'm not going to go into detail of whether you should resurface or not resurface. But if you intend to resurface, which is my personal choice, please understand how to do it the right way. So these are my disclosures where I have my research support consulting and speaking for Smith and Afu and uh, Merrill. The current philosophies is either I routinely resurface the patella or do not resurface at all, but majority would be selective resurfacing. So whether I should be resurfacing or no, there is enough amount of data either ways to consider that uh, resurfacing guys would prove that interior knee pain is lesser, better knee scores, and less chances of reoperation for secondary resurfacing, if at all you have pain. While the proponents of not knee surfacing would say that uh, there's no difference in entire knee pain and you have a physiological preservation of tissues and uh, you save the knee and the bone for future. So to resurface or not is a personal choice. But what does the literature say for patellar resurfacing in total knee arthroplasty and matter analysis of 7,075 cases? Now, if you have anterior knee pain, the secondary patellar resurfacing would add another surgical option. And reoperation rates in non resurfaced patella group is definitely higher. Also, there is a lot of friends who say that, you know, I see the surface of the cartilage and then decide I'm a selective user, open the knee and then make a call. 
Intraoperative assessment of patella cartilage does not predict your functional outcomes after total knee arthroplasty. So late or secondary patella resurfacing is easy and simple, but does not give you a good reward as a primary resurfacing. So in totality, redundant resurfacing would be a better outcome. And selective resurfacing, looking at the cartilage status, is unreliable. Also, while resurfacing, a lot of people ask, is patellar circumcision necessary? That means using electrocautery to take off the fibrosynovial tissues around the patella. So a randomized controlled trial for circumferential cautery in total knee arthroplasty with patella or without patella resurfacing. If you are not resurfacing, then electrocautery of electrocoagulation of the perineural tissues around the patella gives you a benefit. Resection of intrapatellar fat pad. A lot of people keep saying that if you resect the fat pad, you will have higher chances of AVN of the patella. Now, retrospective review of 1000 primary knees post operative pain to fold more. No significant effect on patellar tendon contracture, range of motion, or functional scores by a removal of retropatellar fat pad. But still, an add on would be do not excise the fat pad in totality, leave the remaining section around the patellar tendon, not to have a fibrosis around that area. A lot of uh, surgeons who do MI surgeries were reporting that, you know, if you evert or retract the patella, your uh, pain scores are going to be higher. So what does literature say? So the proponents of MIS would say it has a deleterious effect on early patient rehab and early patient clinical outcomes. So prospective randomized study, no difference at 12 weeks and six months in the range of motion, quad strengths, and patient preferred knee. Also, with patella eversion and anterior tibial translation, no adverse effects on the range of motion, quadriceps strength, or preferred knee, according to patient. Lateral knees, like depending on the kind of implant you're using, we'll discuss it subsequently, but the kind of, uh, whether you're using a patella-friendly implant, what is the kind of rotation you're using it, but till around zero to 10% of cases, lateral release is required to balance the soft tissues. So predictors of outcome are it is required incidence around 8.3%, it increases hospital stay, higher transfusion rates and range of motion is less. Influence of pneumatic tourniquet on patella tracking in total knee arthroplasty. So before you go in for a lateral and necular release, tourniquet deflation and revaluation of the patella tracking is extremely important. What about medialization of patellar component? We have been discussing about the patellar femoral kinematics and dynamics and biomechanics. We want the patella to be sitting inside the trochlear groove by all range of motion right from 0 to 130, 550 degrees. So medialization of patellar button by 2 to 2.5 mm improves the biomechanical consequences of patellar implant. So if you fundamentally understand the design of the implant has to be patella friendly, better instrument designs, better surgical technique, and understanding the art, how to reject the patella and how to do a resurfacing, the incidence of complications have decreased down from the old previous 10 to 35% to the recent around 1 to 12%. As I discussed initially, there are basically three fundamental designs of the patella and your technique depends on that. The inset or the inlay patella is not done in majority, but you could get a concavity in the patella and inset your patellar button in that. Majority of us use the only patellar design, which is what I'll show. Metal back is almost out of league. So the failure modes, what you need to prevent is you do not want to have under section and overstopping of PFJ over section and high chances of fracture of your patella or an eight symmetric section and a mild tracking patella. For an only surgical technique, understand what is your composite thickness before. So under what is your pre-section patella thickness and try to maintain that pre-section patella thickness within two millimeters from a smooth flat symmetric bone resection and do not damage your quadriceps or patellar tendon. Balance your extension mechanism and tracking. The normal width of both the facets is around 37 millimeter with a mean height of medial and lateral about 23 and 14 millimeters. As discussed, the fibrosynovial tissues is taken and reflected out either with a surgical blade or with an electrocautery from its periphery. Remove any overhanging osteophytes. In a lot of cases of inflammatory arthritis and RA, the medial patellar facet will be overgrown by synovium or will be eroded. Do not confuse it with the lateral patellar facet. 
clean the medial border carefully demarcate medial and lateral articular borders you must expose it all throughout 360 degrees with the vernier see the thickness of the patella your average thickness in a male is 25 and a female is 22 but remember even whatever you do as a method to resect your thickness after the resection of the bone has to be minimum of 12 mm because you do not want to have a fracture of your patella for future so you can have all the kind of fancy jigs to do it depending on but whatever jig you use you have to understand the positioning of your jig is extremely important you have to take out synovial tissues you have to have a uniform resection normally the section is from the medial chondroosseous junction to the lateral chondroosseous junction or you can use a free hand through the nose of the patella but do not damage the quadriceps or the patellar tendon have a symmetric bed not an asymmetric area in this you will have a sort of more of a bone on the medial side and a far lesser on the lateral side where you have a compact dense subchondral bone it's not necessary to cover the surface completely within the implant there are different kind of implants available but majority of us use the round or the dome or the medialized dome patellas the process is positioned medially and superiorly so once you put in your implant, depending on the kind of jig that you're using, which matches with your patellar button, you mark it through. You have to medialize the patella. Use an electrocautery, mark the uncapped lateral facet. Make drill holes. The lateral facet, as time and defended, has to be taken off. Otherwise, you will have impingement and pain in the lateral structures, and you will have tilting of your patella. So chamfer your uncapped bone to relieve impingement on the metal trochlea. You see the patellar thickness pre-resection and you have to achieve the composite thickness with the plastic in a combination with the remnant bone within two millimeters of the original one. So patella should be minimum of 12 to 15 millimeters before you put in your button, which is normally eight to nine millimeters of plastic. The bone surface is cleaned with irrigation and dried. In dense subchondral area on the lateral facet, many times you have to use this kind of drill holes for an optimal cement mantle hold. Cement is placed on the bony surface and a patellar clamp is applied to pressurize. Take care to avoid excessive twisting of the patellar tendon and in a soft osteoporotic bone, remember two things. Do not resect the patella before you cut off the tibia and the femur because at times your retractors will just squeeze away your patella. Also, while you're applying your clamp for osteoporotic bones, do not apply too much of pressure or else you will cause an intraoperative fracture. This is how normally your dome shaped patella should look like on implantation. So you expose it through. This is a system where I'm using the patella cramps. See the thickness before surgery. This is eight to nine millimeters of resection from the medial to the lateral chondroosseous junction, depending on the kind of jigs you're going to use. A symmetric resection Use the jig for a three pack button. This is the tune medialized patellar dome. See how it fits like, take off the lateral patellar facet and this is how your medialized dome is going to use. One of the advantages of a medialized dome patella is it allows a better patellar tracking. And this is how your merchant or axial view should look like. Also take out the fibrous novel tissue at the superior pole of the patella because you do not want a clump to develop in subsequently. You should have a balanced extensor mechanism. So the technique before even going on release is see how your patellar button rests on the femoral trochlea. Your femur has to be patella friendly. And before you even think of any kind of a release, always check you have corrected your rotation of your femoral and tibial component. You don't have to internal rotate your tibia or femoral component. You have to lateralize your femoral component. You have to medialize your patellar button. So whenever you see the seating across, it has to seat into LT. If it is tilting, you are planning in for sort of a release. But before that, I always move from this to a clamp technique or a single suture technique. If despite a single suture technique, it is still not tracking well, then you deflate the tunique. And at the end, you do a lateral retinal release. Again, before doing a release, you need to check on if your tightness is an extension, you will do a distal release to the vessel where you will start from the release of retinaculum from a tendon of vostress literalis extending to the lateral joint line.
If you still have tightness in flexion, then use the proximal release, which is at 45 degrees angle into the vastus lateralis area. So the proximal release only goes on if you have a remnant tightness in flexion. So this is the kind of patella you have to have in release the perisnovial tissues, take off the osteophytes before you think of the section. But these are the cases where I think doing a resurfacing definitely is better than leaving it as such. These are the different kinds of patellar buttons that are available depending on what kind of implant you're using and what is your choice. So my personal opinion, I resurface majority of the patellas. The only conditions where I do not resurface is if I find a great cartilage with a thin patella where it is less than 17 mm and I feel that section on 9 mm is going to remain a very small shell of bone. Prior patellar fracture, extreme patella, baha or alta where you have more complications, even placing the patella superiorly or inferiorly is going to cause impingement into the trochlea and Complications are minimal when done right. You have to balance your patella well into the sulcus and sort of balance your lateral and medial structures, which I'll show in one of the cases next. So the technical precision to conduct a surgical procedure will remarkably reduce most of your concerns. You have to understand the rotation of the femur is extremely, extremely important before you think of a maltracking happening through. Also in cases where we discuss you, despite everything, if you have a mild tracking happening through done lateral release also, those are the cases in a malalignment, you might have to do a tibial tubercle osteotomy to realign your button. So the mild tracking of patella is usually multifactorial. You have a residual valgus alignment of your limb, a poor geometry of the implant, patella alta, or excessive valgus into the femoral component or internal rotation of the femoral component. So the first case, here, the problem is your overall patellar thickness is excessive. The patellar component is lateralized. You have an asymmetric resection. The trochlear flange of the implant is extremely shallow. Also, the proximal extent, the aspect ratio, the proximal extent of the trochlea is very, very narrow. The femoral component is in valgus, as you see. Also, the overall limb alignment is excessive. So it is not a question of that you have a complication. The complication is because there are multiple issues with the design of the implant and the surgical technique that does not give you good patellar hold. This is one of the docs we just operated a doctor who had 35 years old lateral dislocation of patella and was walking like this with braces for 30, 35 years. So these are challenging cases. If we just went back in, in those cases, you had a hypoplastic trochlea. You have to understand, you have to do a trochleoplasty and address the issues. You have to have a proper seating of your femoral component. It was a tight lateral side, the lateral release was done and the medial side, the VMO was extremely stretched out and lax. So here we have done the vest on the pants technique of imbrication of the medial side. Once you do these systems, without even going in for a tibial tubercle osteotomy, in majority of the cases, you can have a good reconstruction. But wherein cases, you still have a malalignment, please don't leave it as such. Those are the cases you might need to have a secondary reinforcement with a tibial tubercle osteotomy. So to conclude, results of primary patellar resurfacing are generally superior. non resurface patellas still have a higher rate of anterior knee pain and reoperation rate. And if you have to do a secondary resurfacing, the results are inferior. So surgical technique and component alignment are crucial to avoid any patellofemoral complications. With this, any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you, Manoj. Uh, those are excellent uh, you know, practical tips how to do a proper patellar resurfacing. Really enjoyed the lecture. You have touched uh, each and every point of patellar resurfacing. Thanks for that. We can take a couple of questions before going to Rami's lecture. Just to, you know, word one point that um, regarding the, you know, circumferential circumcision of the patella, a patella denervation. A recent paper in 2020, a beautiful paper for, in COR or clinical orthopedics from Nicholas uh, Buddhi Pharma from Indonesia has come. In bilateral T-care, they have done one side denervation one side, they have not done denervation and both the patella are not resurfaced in about uh, some 78 cases. So that is, you know, multiplied by two, the number of knees. And uh, the end result shows it doesn't make any de difference a denervation or you don't do denervation. All these scores and all, you know, statistically it is not significant. It's 2020 paper, beautiful paper. So I have a question. Yeah. Um, 
David. Any specific tips or tricks to revise a patella component? When you're doing a revision surgery and you have to remove the old patella component, this is one of the most challenging situations in terms of how much bone you have left. How do you manage the patella in the revision situation? Yeah, David, it's more of a problem for us in India because our patellas are very thin. Our patients are very small in stature, so anthropoidic dimensions are not very supported. And along with that, we have a patient who are osteopenic to osteoporotic. So in a revision case scenario, if we realize that our native patella is not going to match up with the new design of the femoral component we are going to use it, we would shave off the undersurface of the plastic, retaining the pegs as such. So we'll shave off the base the base of the poly from the peg area and take off. And then subsequently with a fine midas, take out those plastic plugs. We many a times in a smaller kind try to move from, if it has been a single button patella, we'll move on to a three peg design or vice versa in those cases. It is very, very important to preserve as much of the host native bone left in, in Indian based scenario. And it's always a challenge that while you're cutting and using a so to cut it through, you don't shelf into the host bone. I think Manoj, that's the next talk also, I think. Yeah. Um, just one question, Manoj. When you have uh, a patellar femoral arthritis one, principally... One, one, one second, Rakesh, uh, uh, Rajiv has raised the hand before. And just okay. Rajiv, your, your uh, question. Uh, thank you, Shubhraj. Manoj, uh, wonderful presentation. Now, whenever we talk about the patellar resurfacing, always the question is whether to resurface or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is your experience in your patients where you have resurfaced and you have not resurfaced? So what has been your experience in your large number of cases? Rakesh, to be honest, we are still learning. Uh, it depends on the kind of training in the implants. My initial training was uh, like not to resurface for initial 10, 12,000 knees that I did, I did not resurface. Now, working with Ritit Ranavatado, my thought process changed when I came back in the last 15, 20,000, I would have all, almost always resurfaced. My only point is the initial designs of implant were different. And me purely as on the side of a designer surgeon was very, very clear that, you know, people have different philosophies and we have to respect that. Very, very important is the shape of the trochlea of the femur. So when you choose an implant, it has to be a patella friendly design. It has to have an inherent velgus. It has to have a trochlear recess. Ideally, if you ask me the designs of the femoral component for people who want to resurface and do not want to resurface should be different based on the kinematics. Where you do not want to resurface the patella, it has to have a V-shaped trochlear sulcus. And yeah, very rightly mentioned. Yeah, very rightly mentioned that femoral component uh, is very, very important in, the, in deciding now, would you agree with me that at least in a very osteoporotic bone, uh, mostly the rheumatoid patients, uh, I prefer that uh, it's better not to resurface those osteoporotic uh, and very thin. Uh, do you agree with that? Rajiv, I, I have done a lot of cases where I have meant around that I left in remnant 12 mm as a cutoff. So even if it was 17 mm, I would take off just 5, 6 mm and remaining the remaining 12 mm would remain on. And for a rheumatoid, I, I don't know, I would have a hunch, but I would always go and resurface those patellas because they are always painful otherwise. But you're right for an osteoporotic and a thin patella. It's a thought process. I would keep the remnant on, give a composite add-on of around two to three millimeters and would always resurface those situations. But again, the jury is open. People would think differently. Yeah. Yeah, Rakesh, yeah. Rakesh followed by Ashit. Rakesh. Yeah, so uh, you know the paper you quoted, uh, uh, Manoj, regarding that Newman paper regarding whether you look at a patella. We were actually part of that uh, paper. I used to work with Newman. So uh, that thought which came out was that sometimes when we looked, even in uh, British patients, we had sometimes very thin patellas. So he didn't resurface them. And then when he saw them, he was a very, very good person with, uh, you know, follow-ups and all that. We had to fill up all those forms, I remember. So when he came, patients came back, there wasn't pain. So he thought, why don't we do this study? But that study was different anyway. My question was to you, if you have a patellar femoral arthritis, which is today's theme, with uh, a subluxated patella, very badly subluxated. So in that case, would you do uh, or suggest a patellar femoral replacement with TBL tubercular alignment? Or would you do a TKR, which uh, I think David said is a safer uh, option in these patients? 
So in all those cases where I feel that there is a dysplasia which is already there, I would still let any sort of an onlate pattern, whether you're doing a PFJ or you're doing a TKR, but it has to be an only where you have a trochlea right up on the lateral side. You have to be very, very sure that in extension, your patella, the distal end of the patella has to be seating on into the femoral sulcus. If it does not sit on to the trochlea, you're inviting trouble for yourself. So it has to seat on and you have to see the transition going from 0 to 35, 35 to 90 and beyond that time because beyond that it has to seat into the groove which is uh, adjusting with the medial and lateral articular cartilages also. So the tracking is extremely important. Majority of the cases, even if you have a dysplasia and you have balanced your lateral and medial sides well, would let you wean off. I would have done a tibial tubercle osteotomy maybe Two out of 10,000 cases, I would say, is the kind of incidence in my personal hands I could feel through. But majority of them, with the soft tissue reconstruction, proper placement of your femoral and uh, tibial components, it weans off. The kind of case I showed you with a total uh, dislocation from 30 years was one of the examples of these kind of reconstructions. Normally, soft tissue alignment with the proper placement would bail you off any extensive realignment procedure. Yeah, I think, I think right. Manuj, so now we have a very clear indication of people who are doing uh, patella resurfacing in all the cases. And we on the other group, we have a lot of surgeons in our country who do not resurface even if it is grade four. So now since you've done fair amount in both of them, do you still think that if we don't resurface those patella, do those patients come back with a lot of complications like anterior knee pain? And secondly, Reviewing the literature, I know I did this in 2017 IA, which was in Kolkata. Uh, still, there is lack of clear criteria in literature when to resurface and when not to resurface. Would you agree there or you have slightly different uh, viewpoint, Manuj? So, uh, so if I have to be truthful, I would have loved to resurface all of them today. But because of the financial constraint, a lot of government-based parameters where an additional cost is not allowed, uh, so around say 10% of the cases, I do not resurface, but the reasons are different. But if you'd say people come back with a huge amount of failures, the answer is no. Okay. With the newer designs, okay. you still have a grace left with you of not resurfacing. But all in cases where you have an inflammation, inflammatory arthritis, I think there's a must. Yeah, correct. Thanks, Manoj. I think uh, we should go ahead with the next lecture. Uh, uh, there is a question in the chat box from Dr. Nayak that uh, how did you do trochleoplasty and TKR in the same sitting in the last case you showed? No, not trochleoplasty. I realigned the trochlea. It was a hypoplastic trochlea. So we rebuilt that gutter across to make it happen. Okay. So let's uh, move ahead with our uh, last uh, lecture today from... Uh, Rami Shuriel from Sydney, Australia. Yeah. Ask the Post Association. Unfortunately, I can't be with you, but I've taken a share screen here that from my last time in Mumbai, so at least it feels the part. I also, due to a prior engagement, won't be able to take questions because I will be elsewhere other than Sydney. But it is my pleasure to actually be sharing with you my experience on the use of a trabecular metal augmented patella for advanced patellofemoral arthritis. This is a 15-year Avon patellofemoral arthroplasty. Just happened to come back in. Patient is still asymptomatic and is one of the solutions for patellofemoral arthritis. However, uh, these have a bad track record in the Australian Joint Registry with a 30 to 40% revision rate. So it's not necessarily the go-to for the sort of presentation that we're going to discuss today. Typical tricompartmental osteoarthritis, failed non-operative management. Solutions generally in my hands is routine total knee arthroplasty. I use cementless cruciate retaining as a whole, selective patellar resurfacing for extensive wear, and in circumstances, usually about 20% of my TKAs receive a patellar resurfacing. This is fairly straightforward. But this is what I want to discuss today. The advanced patellofemoral arthritis that has advanced patella bone loss. What are the solutions for these patients in particular when managing the patellar aspect of your tricompartmental osteoarthritis? 
To demonstrate that, I'm going to go through a case presentation only because of the interest that it sparked up when it became more than just the knee replacement, it became a complex representation after a trauma. This is a 67 year old overweight female presents with disabling knee pain, has been increasing intensity over a period of three years. She has difficulty walking distances greater than 200 metres. She's unable to negotiate stairs, frequent giving way episodes. She has knee stiffness and recurrent effusions. Her initial x-rays on presentation are here for you to actually appreciate. She has advanced patellofemoral arthritis, as you can see, as well as arthritis of the medial compartment, quite an extent. But the most remarkable feature of her presentation is really the advanced nature of her bone loss. You can see here on the skyline view, there's not much patella bone to actually work with, and this replicated itself when we opened through the standard medial parapetella approach. The intraoperative findings she had a very thin concave patella that actually measured less than five millimeters thick. The question is, what can you do for these patients? A very thin patella cannot be resurfaced in the standard fashion. What are the options? And it simply left the stress on the concavity as a potential of leading to a periprosthetic fracture and complicating her outcomes. So the options of management as I see it in the patient who has patella bone stock deficiency are a major debridement and do a patella resection arthroplasty, excise all the osteophytes, minimize the size of the patella to a very small disc of bone. The risks here are anterior knee pain and potentially a compromised extensive mechanism. You can osteotomize the patella vertically, that is in fact do a gull wing osteotomy, allowing it to become convex and track centrally on the femur. The risks here again include anterior knee pain and compromised extensive mechanism. You can perform a patellectomy. The risks here include compromised extensive mechanism, extensor lag, and potentially anterior knee pain. Or you can cement a very large patella button into the defect. If you risk poor cement fixation into what's left of the bone shell, early failure by dissociation, pain, compromised extensor mechanism. You can cement an all poly biconvex patella button if you can have it available. But again, that has its own complications. You can bone graft the patella with autologous bone off cuts and cement the patella button onto that. Then you have to wait for the bone to actually integrate and that can be delayed procedure. Or you can use a porous trabecular metal augment patella replacement, which I'll discuss today. The porous tantalum patella prosthesis addresses the issues of severely bone deficient patella in primary and revision knee surgery. It originally came out for revision knee surgery. It's actually been around for a couple of decades. But I'm going to discuss it here in the realm of primary knee arthroplasty. It relies on bone ingrowth into the porous tantalum surface and the polypatella component is cemented onto the tantalum component. As a track record, this um, article from Paul Watke and his group on the use of trabecular metal patella for mark patella bone loss during revision knee arthroplasty showed that in this circumstance, there is an 85% success rate. And usually where there is a failure, it's when there's little, if any, residual bone shell left to put the tantalum surface onto. So if you have a residual bone shell, you're more likely to have a successful outcome. Technique specifically, you expose the patella surface usually less than 10 millimeters. It does have its own rema, but I find that a standard 50 millimeter acetabular hemispherical rema does a much better job at freshening up the bone surface and giving you a hemispherical surface onto which to sit the tantalum patella augment. This needs to sit. It has good roughness on the surface, so it will sit with good stability initially, but then needs to be fixed to the bone shell. Using 1.6 millimeter drill bit or similar or even a thick K wire, you make holes at the base through the holes within the tantal augment. You then use a Keith needle and you can use a suture material, but it needs to be a non-absorbable. I use fiber wire as standard because it's very strong, it will stay there. Pass fiber wire sutures through couplets and then tie them on the anterior surface of the patella, stabilizing the tantal augment. It's, it's very good stability. And then onto that, you can see in the left photo here, these are the multiple sutures coming through, each tied over the anterior surface in couplets. And then you've got a surface onto which to cement a standard polyethylene patella button. Using CMW, CMW2 cement, I then cement onto that surface, wait for the cement to cure, measure the thickness, and generally you're reconstructing a 22 to 24 millimeter thickness patella, improving the fulcrum for the quadriceps mechanism. 
post-op x-rays in this particular patient. At six weeks, the patient was pain-free and mobilizing well. I used a standard post-operative protocol for these patients in terms of mobilization, weight bearers tolerated, and range of motion um, with physiotherapy input is for a standard routine protocol. This particular patient at six months was doing very well. And again, on examination, she had good quads control and a very good range of motion. The reason I'm presenting this patient is because at two years later, she had a fall and ruptured the patella tendon, which was a very complex presentation at that stage. She had poor material there, but we ended up doing a reconstruction using a Lars ligament uh, with Lars tape basically double-breasted over the front and integrated into the remnants of the patella tendon put through drill holes in the tibia and through the quadriceps mechanism to give her a reconstruction extensor mechanism. This is six months after that reconstruction with very good functional recovery for this patient. This is a 72 year old lady who has predominantly patellofemoral osteoarthritis with significant bone loss. You can see the same problem here. Post-op, trabecular metal patella recon with primary total knee arthroplasty, routine cementless CR. And here at three months post-op, restored patella height looking very good. 69 year old female with bilateral patellofemoral osteoarthritis. I chose to do them at separate staged intervals of six months. This is the right side first with patella augmentation. This is six weeks after her right total knee replacement with the trabecular metal patella. Routine post-op protocols for all these patients and at six weeks they're ambulating well. They have a good range of motion and good quadriceps strength. Six months later, we went ahead with left side, similar uh, trabecular augment for the patella. This is the six months radiograph of her right knee with good integration of bone into the augment. And you can see here six weeks after the left and six months after the right, she has good quads control, a good range of motion and good strength. So I would suggest any measured patella with a thickness of less than 10 millimetres, a misshapen patella anatomy not suitable for a standard key lip in debridement and in a primary or revision setting, this is a good indication for surgery. This patient was 75 years of age and at six weeks you can see good integration into the bone. Six weeks post trabecular metal recon again, good range of motion, good strength, good control. And another lady, 72 years with valgus and patellofemoral OA, again, a standard post-operative film. So Piccolo and the Italian group reported on 10 patients with follow-up for 45 months, only failure in a case post patellectomy with no residual patella bones. In conclusion, trabecular metal augmented patellar arthroplasty restores patella thickness, optimizes quadriceps moment to arm, allows polyethylene articulation with femoral component, no impact on post-op rehabilitation, decreases the risk of extensor lag, reduces the incidence of anterior knee pain, expects success with deficient or residual patella bone thickness. Thank you for your attention. If I can grab just a few seconds here to let you know and invite you to the APAS 2021 forum coming up on Saturdays, July 10, 17 and 24. We'll have live streaming of 12 surgical procedures, multiple symposia and debates please check out our site, apas2021.com. Thank you, and I hope one day to be with you in the same room, sharing the camaraderie of good fellowship. Have a good meeting. We thank uh, for Rami for that excellent uh, uh, lecture, and uh, thanks, Rami, for using uh, the Mumbai background in a uh, virtual background during your lecture. Uh, actually, I asked Rami a couple of questions and uh, we had a discussion that uh, I asked him that how many cases he has done and uh, he has done six cases over the last four years and uh, almost all of them have recovered with good outcome. And I asked, is there any complications you faced? He told no complications except that one case which he showed as a ruptured patella tendon and uh, ultimately he reconstructed that. And uh, I asked that any any technical tips to do this, that he mentioned that uh, the only technical tip that he would like to give you that use the acetabular rimmers while preparing the patella, depending upon the size. Of course, he used the 50 size rimmers, but uh, we can use in a small patella, maybe smaller size rimmers. Uh, and uh, not a very, uh, because the rimmers which are provided are not very sharp uh, by the manufacturer. And, uh, no age restrictions. I asked that whether age and old is no age restrictions. And uh, 
Uh, I asked that whether you have published that. He has not published yet, at, uh, and is waiting for a five years follow up, and then he will publish it. So that's all about uh, you know Rami's paper. Uh, now my my one question is that how many how many of the uh, of our faculty here, uh, how many of uh, surgeons here have done a secondary patella resurfacing, and what is the outcome? I haven't done one until now. A any of you, uh, David, have you done any secondary patella resurfacing? David, so you're talking about a, a case where someone comes with a total knee that where the first surgery was the patella was not resurfaced, and then I'm addressing the residual pain. So in the U.S., this is uncommon because the standard of care in the U.S. is to resurface all patella. Um, I would tell you that the temptation, as was indicated in the paper, when someone presents with a painful total knee and they give you something that looks rather obvious is to go ahead and resurface the patella and hope for the best. The challenge is that that's often not the only problem. Um, so I have a case coming up, for example, where the patient has a painful uh, total knee and their issue is, is pain and they're grabbing the front of their knee and they don't have a resurfaced patella. But when we get a CT scan, we can see the rotation of the components is off. And, and that's a cause of pain. He also has mid flexion instability. So I, I think that when you're looking at a, an unresurfaced patella, you have to continue to do your normal workup as you would for any revision arthroplasty, make sure the components on the femur and the tibia are appropriately positioned and rotated and be prepared to do a complete revision because often the uh, unresurfaced patella is not the only problem. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, there are no more questions. Yeah, Manuj, over to you. So uh, as uh, David rightly said, you have to first check on whether your alignment of the components is right before you think of anterior knee pain as because of unresurfaced patella. I've done around 15 of those and majority of them were PFC sigmas as a primary. In all those cases where the issue was infrapatellar retaining osteophyte, which was causing an impingement, people were happy. So if you ask me out of 15, how many were really happy after secondary resurfacing? Less than 50% was the answer. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, at least I have uh, seen uh, five, six patients, uh, those are unhappy. And when I suggested them that secondary patellar research can be done, but uh, I cannot predict the result, then they go away. Yeah. So no, they don't come back. <laughs> I think we move ahead with uh, guest discussions uh, from Krishna. Now, Krishna, all yours. Can you see the presentation, sir? Not, uh, not, not yet. Yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, all good. So I put together a few cases uh, uh, pertaining to the patellofemoral uh, joint. So now uh, this is the first case, 60-year-old lady with uh, pain and deformity in the right knee for five years. She had a history of traumatic patellar fracture about two years back and no treatment. And now she has uh, inability to walk and there's no active extension and the range of motion passively is 0 to 120. And this is her x-ray. So, maybe David can make a comment on that, yeah. <laughs> My comment is first to thank you for giving us very easy cases to begin with. <laughs> So this is a challenging case. I think uh, when you have extensor mechanism disruption, this is a, a very difficult problem to deal with. And um, I, I think it's never a bad option to remember that a knee fusion is, uh, is something to have in the back pocket if necessary. Um, and that sometimes is the only option you have that is gonna be reliable. Um, and a knee fusion is something that I do rarely, but has reasonable uh, results. This patient, you would do uh, a revision style total knee with uh, stems and augments and cones uh, to deal with the severe bone loss immediately. And I would do an allograft patella tendon uh, reconstruction. And 
this would, I would lay a lot of crepe with this patient and tell them there's a high risk of reoperation, high risk of infection, particularly with the allograft, and that the consequences if you're putting in this big construct with uh, cemented stems and cones, uh, God forbid, if it does get infected, then you may be left with fusion or an amputation as your only option for revision surgery. So this would be um, a challenging case, but doable. And, and it's either going to be a home run or uh, a very uh, bad outcome. Dr. Uh, uh, R.K. Sharma maybe can take this. Uh, what would you do? Well, this, this, is, this is quite a quite an interesting case. And what I see, uh, if you see the distal fragment of the tibia, of, 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 the, of the petilla, yeah. uh, you see it is, it is almost uh, 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 very close to the, to the tibial tubercle. So we expect that this fracture petilla has been for a long time. The proximal fragment has retracted a lot. The rest of the knee should be, uh, should be, uh, simple, um, uh, but I think the ma main uh, management issue will be the patellar, uh, how, how, do you, how do you manage the extensor mechanism? And if I have to do it, I will try to uh, proximalize the fem femur, uh, release the patella from uh, uh, proximal fragment and try to uh, distalize it and uh, uh, fix the, uh, the patellar tendon uh, with the proximal fragment uh, with the uh, ethibon and uh, uh, keep, keep this patient in some, uh, for some time in the immobilizer for a period of say two weeks and then start mobilization of the knee uh, and tell the family and patient that this patient may have little less range of motion maybe up to 90 degrees or maybe less. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Mohanty. Yeah, you know, um, this is like a uh, probably inferior pole patellar fracture. Yeah. And uh, uh, regarding the tibiofemoral part, uh, okay, I agree with Rajiv that we can get away with the primary prosthesis or maximum a TC3 or LCCK type of prosthesis. Uh, for patella, what I would do, as uh, I agree with Rajiv that uh, we have to elevate the joint line that taking more distal cut of the femur and uh, maybe with a thicker polyethylene and less uh, distal tib uh, proximal tibial cut. For patella, what I would do that I'll take a semi tendinous tendon and then reinforce around uh, on the superior aspect of patella or through the patella, then just suture onto itself uh, on the medial side of tibia. So that will give a reinforcement. It's like, you know, patellar tendon rupture during post, uh, you know, during the revision <laughs> surgery, what we have done in a couple of cases. That we reinforce semi-tendinous tendon, then uh, take it either as just proximal pole of the patella or through the patella, and then turn it around and suture onto itself and protect it for about three months. That's my take on this. Yeah, Dr. Rutham. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, have you done MRI before that? Because I just want to give, uh, see the continuity of the patellar tendon is there. It seems uh, quite apart, but it may be possible. Is there a continuity is the patellar tendon or the cordyceps? Because we it's a quite... Do any, we did not do any MRI on this uh, patient. Clinically, how you feel? Is there a gap? Here, here yeah, shown an intra picture, actually. This I can show the... Yeah, so, uh, so uh, this is the intro picture. So this was all the uh, tissue which had formed between the proximal uh, and the distal part of the uh, fracture. So this was filled with fibrous tissue. So what we did was we uh, retained this fibrous tissue for augmentation. As Dr. Mohanty said, initially I had planned to take the semitendinosis to augment the repair. But I thought this is a good fibrous tissue. We should retain it and... Uh, try and repair using the fibrous tissue as an augment. So that, that's the gap there around uh, four or five centimeters. And uh, after the uh, knee replacement was pretty straightforward as uh, uh, most of the Indian surgeons have uh, a lot of experience with these sort of cases. So 
it was a primary ps knee we did a computer assisted uh, surgery for the knee uh, we made multiple drill holes in the upper part of the patella and no attempt was made to get the bone fragments together uh, so the patella tendon we took multiple whip stitches three uh, like the acl stitch made drill holes in the patella and then stitched the uh, patella tendon in extension to the avail- available proximal fragment another concern for us was whether we would have to do a sort of a quadriceps distalization rather than joint line proximalization so that was in mind so we could do a sort of a vy plasty for the quadriceps not the formal vy but you can uh, do a modified vy plasty to bring the patella down if required that was not needed we were able to get the patella tendon to the uh, patella get it reasonably stable and augmented that with a uh, with the fibrous tissue which was there at the gap and we could identify the gap in the uh, vastus medialis and lateralis as well medially laterally which we were able to approximate in the patient so on table the flexion was around 60 degrees as dr uh, sharma pointed out and this is the post operative x ray you can see that the patella has come down inferiorly the uh, the fragment is reasonably mobilized but there is a gap at the fracture site which we were not very worried about because the aim was not to achieve union at this uh, fracture uh and this is the uh, outcome at around 3 months you can see the there is no extension lag and the patient has around 90 degrees of flexion and the post operative protocol was that we immobilized the knee in extension for 4 weeks and then started the mobilization and the patient is now 6 months out and uh, reasonably uh, satisfied with the outcome any comments on that krishna can i say something here sir yeah no problem yeah krishna so um the uh, the way we have approximated this with this bone fragments lying that far what uh, we have seen sometimes after like certain fractures of these patellas post tk care also if you follow them up for like 3 4 years these patella now starts becoming very thin and stretched out because it was not being forced it remained like a solid particle but now when we have joined them to, uh, together with even the tendon healing and now when the knee is constantly being flexed there is a pull on these fragments and they start becoming a very thin stretch of tissues you still retain some active extension but it gets actually weaker than what you have now uh, i wonder if you have that same sort of experience the uh, the uh, the aim in this was to achieve quadriceps continuity uh, patella i would agree with you that it may become thinner or something with time but uh, uh, given her pre operative condition we have uh, avoided a relatively complex extensor mechanism allograft so we have some choice for a future revision if it is warranted and she is able to walk independently with a stick and uh, there is no extension lag at this point in time so i think we were able to restore the quadriceps continuity that's the bottom line you may not get bony continuity there but medially laterally as you know in patellar displaced fractures it's also the quadriceps which is stone which is uh, uh, it's not the bone itself so we were able to actually get the vastus medialis and lateralis approximated properly this bone gap we could not approximate and it was not the aim of the surgery as well right i think uh, this is an elegant solution to a very difficult problem i i love the idea of having a biological logic augmentation of a semitendinosus through the patella have you considered i i'm concerned though about stretching out these inferior tissues um in some cases where we've had uh problems with the extensor mechanism we've on laid a vascular graft you know and sewn it into the quadricep weaved it into the extensor mechanism and then with screws into the tibia that might be an option to uh act as a check rein and prevent stretching out of this reconstructed uh tissue inferior to the patella. So I I I like this solution it's much better than a patella uh allograft but um the augmentation with the uh, Gore-Tex vascular graft to give extra support might be a consideration. Yeah I think it's a point well taken we uh, we considered all options and we chose to do the easiest and the simplest which we thought would work for this patient. So all the complex options can wait so if this lasts for some time we can still go with all the other options if there is a failure at some point in time 
Krishna, this Krishna. along with, uh, you know, what you've done along with the semi-T graft would have been really an ideal thing because it would prevent that stretching, which Rakesh was just mentioning that after a few years, you know, this would start stretching out. And this, whatever you prepare, you've done along with semi-T rooting around the patella as we used to do for patella tendon uh, fresh ruptures would have been ideal. You know, it would not include a lot of things, you know, the soft tissue is available there. Might as well, it would have uh, been a better option to... Fair enough. So, what we did was we took that fibrous tissue which had formed, we double-breasted it, retained the lateral vascular attachment and repaired it around the... Uh, we augmented the repair with that. So, instead of taking a semi-T additionally, we used whatever tissue was available. We didn't excise it. See, the collagen in fibrous tissue and the collagen in semi-T yeah. would be a lot different. Yeah, you know, the fibrous tissue would not have so much of collagen to support this. I mean, that's what is just uh, one argument. I think it's a fair, fair comment, actually. The petal tendon was reasonably good. We were able to get a reasonable approximation there. Lateral and medial repair were reasonable. Sure. And uh, she's holding on at this point in time. So, we'll see it what Krishna, 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 success cannot be challenged. So, let us yes. uh, move on to the next <laughs> case, please. Uh, because uh, we have very short okay, of time. Yeah. yeah, so this now we have a 64 year old lady with bilateral knee pain affecting and activities of daily living, anterior knee pain, and difficulty with stair climbing for the last few years. And this is a case uh, uh, with bilateral knee arthritis, and you can see here that uh, 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 to cut a long story short, there is no petal on the right side and a hypoplastic petella on the left side. So, it's a Dejor type C trochlea. So, there's a trochlear dysplasia along with absent petella, which is, you know, a rare uh, uh, situation. So, Dr. Ashit, can you take this case? Any challenges you anticipate or? The challenge, challenge here are doubled because it's a bilateral case. Uh, so, yeah. so, now on the right side, obviously, since there is no patella and... Um, um, and how, how much is the extension? Zero or he's got a, she's got an extension? It has got reasonable range of motion. There's no extension lag. Uh, uh, and just for your uh, uh, purpose, we got the CT on the other side where there was a small patella. Mm. Where the patella is uh, laterally shifted and it's subluxating out. And it's a very small hypoplastic patella. Correct. That's on, the, on the left side. Correct. Yeah. So, on the right side, obviously, you know, when you are... Uh, considering and she's obviously painful um, probably a posterior stabilized uh, totine replacement um, definitely posterior stabilized because that is what is said that in a patellectomized patient or patients who have absent patella a PS knee is something that is uh, a standard um, uh, you know processes for those kind of cases yeah as far as left is concerned uh, Really, again, uh, if we can, because the issue on that CT scan that you showed was the lateral subluxation of the patella, and it's a very small patella. So when you expose that knee and you take the measurement of the patella, it would be maybe not more than 7, 8 or 10 millimeters of patella. You have to basically work on getting the alignment of that patella, hypoplastic patella, into the trochlear notch. Uh, so that is what I would... Uh, you know, suggest that that is what something that you should do. Anything different from uh, uh, saying any uh, any comments on uh, the uh, how common is a uh, absent or a hypoplastic patella and what it is associated with in the absence of any other syndrome? Krishna, is, it, is it from uh, birth or uh, uh, is there excised patella? No, no, it is from birth. It's a congenital absent patella congenital on absent. and hypoplastic, okay. which is. Uh, uh, I thought it is pretty rare because it's usually a syndrome. Yeah, uh, yeah very yeah. rare. Uh, uh, Krishna, uh, unless you have uh, iliac horns and all that nail patella syndromes. But otherwise, it's very rare on its own. Uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. when, uh, to this extent of uh, hypoplasia. Mm -hmm. Usually, they are very very yeah, usually. Uh, and, and what is what probably uh, is right in this kind of a situation is treat it as a uh, post patellectomy. Yes. Uh, yeah. Correct. Mm. And a uh, uh, few things that I will, uh, uh, if I am doing, I'll, I'll prefer here that one, the femoral component should should be should not be a larger size, and it should be a it should be shifted slightly posteriorly, 
uh, some amount of notching I'll accept, maybe two millimeter, so that there is a enough enough space for the for the extensor mechanism to glide over it, and and rest will be the the same way 100%. as. Uh, um, uh, is suggested very rightly on the left side where you have a small patella, uh, probably the right kind of a rotation of the femoral component will be very important and the, and the lateral release uh, probably will be able to bring it to the trochlea of an of implanted joint. I think there is a fair comment. The uh, basic premise for this particular uh, case is that all these sort of situations with uh, absent or hypoplastic patella are usually associated with a maltracking extensor mechanism. So the uh, restoration of extensor mechanism tracking is an important point for uh, surgery, whether it is through proximal realignment you're able to achieve like Manoj uh, showed in his cases, or you would have to do a uh, some sort of a distal realignment if needed. Usually you'll be able to get away with some proximal realignment procedures like lateral release and uh, medial glycation. So this is an uh, Krishna, Krishna, before you proceed, uh, can we have David's opinion on that? Yeah, sure. David, uh, you have any anything different or any different opinion regarding this case? And when you look at those uh, x-rays, you can see that it appears to be a very small lateral femoral condyle. So I think you have to be very mindful of your femoral component rotation. And as was indicated before, any case where there's a padlectomy, you have to use a posterior stabilized component that's mandatory. And whatever you have left of your extensor mechanism, you have to make sure that whether there's a patella there or not, it tracks within the groove. So you have to be prepared to release lateral and tighten medial tissues to get that tube of tissue that's connecting the quadricep to the tibia to, to track in the groove to optimize that extensor function. So this is another easy case that you guys are sharing. So thank you for making the panel stub, you know, smooth and easy. <laughs> I'm so interested to see how you did. That. So, uh, uh, yeah. uh, most of my knees, I also do through the subvastus approach. And uh, this was what we found in drop. There was no trochlea on the uh, right side. And uh, uh, on the left side, there was a very small hypoplastic patella. And we had to do a, a, a complete lateral release to realign this extensor mechanism. And uh, this is the post-operative x-ray. We did an anterior stabilized knee replacement. So I normally don't do any PS knees. So I would put an ultra congruent insert in such situations. So I, I, that's the standard for me. So if, if I needed to do a, a PS in a primary, I would do an ultra congruent insert. So remove the PCL and put a UC insert. And this is the post-operative x-ray. You can see that... Uh, uh, on the left side, whatever is the remnant of the patella is tracking in the center of the uh, knee and this patient is doing pretty well. Any comments uh, and, or should I go to the next case? Uh, yeah, we do we the medial uh, reinforcement, uh, Krishna. Yeah. Sorry, sir. How did you do the medial reinforcement? In this, just... in, in this particular case, I just got away with the lateral release. I didn't need to do a medial reinforcement. But if I had a dislocated patella, I would do a medial parapatellar approach and then stitch the uh, stitch the medial side to the lateral side. I have one more case I will show you. Uh, on onto the uh, the wherever I have done a lateral release, I would stitch this on top of that on top of the patella to that particular thing. The Tajian procedure I would. Do. Like uh, yeah. what Ashit said, uh, generally when you have chronic uh, things like that with underlying uh, mall uh, tracking, uh, you need to have more collagen. You need to put a, an MPFL, you know, you need to put a semi D or something like that. Uh, these things uh, have been proven uh, over and over again. It works temporarily and then they don't. So you need to reinforce it. You have to do a formal MPFL on the, on the middle side. Uh, Krishna, just one question. Um, and uh, and this is for the all the Indian faculties. Does any of we have uh, experience with this uh, uh, the tantalum patella, the one which is TM patella, which was just being discussed? The, in that case, this would be one of the indications to start doing that. This, this was not available. Uh, is it available now? Jimar has said, but uh, I asked them. Uh, it's available now, but I mean, have we used it? No, I have not used it. 
So, Monty, in one of the cases, Dr. Rajgopal presented uh, TM Patela. I think it is available. It's available now. In each case, he presented one of the cases. Okay. So, the message, message here for this case, uh, for the, you know, for the, the participants that, uh, you know, in the exercise Patela or absent Patela, it is the PS knee has to be done. No CR knee, no role of CR knee. But, uh, you know, there is a paper for Harry Rubas in 2016 or 2017, something like that. They have shown in exercise Patella both CR and PSN, uh, they are doing equally good. There is no significant difference. But for the messages that we must do, a, you know, probably either a ultra congruent insert or a PSN in this kind of case. Yeah, Krishna. So this is a case uh, from uh, Manuj, uh, Manuj's unit. So I borrowed it from him. A uh, 64-year-old lady with uh, bilateral knee pain and significant anterior knee pain for one year. So, uh, there is a, a spoiler uh, for this case. So, for the faculty, uh, what are the options apart from a TKR? So, TKR definitely is an option uh, if the patient is significantly symptomatic. But, David, would you consider a, a bicompartmental replacement or uh, because lateral side looks reasonably okay? ACL is intact because the the lateral view you can see that the femur is articulating reasonably anteriorly. Martin so, would do. So David, uh, any thoughts yeah. on? I I think you know you have to talk to the patient and see what their functional demands and expectations are. She she looks like uh, someone who has a, a high BMI. So I'm going to be cautious doing a partial knee resurfacing, either a PFJ or a uni in patients who are larger and see what their functional demands are. If she doesn't really complain of tibiofemoral pain, you could consider a patellofemoral arthroplasty. Be prepared to add a uni if you don't like her medial compartment. Um, but in these patients who are larger, you know, you're definitely going to be safer with a, a total knee than with a, a partial knee resurfacing. I think Manoj is the correct person to take us to this case. Yeah. So, David, uh, BMI was not very high. It's a typical kind of a fat presentation we get in North India, short females with uh, uh, fat condition around the lower end of the uh, thigh area. So, it was not a very high BMI per se. So, now she had features clearly, as Krishna said, she had an ACL, a retained ACL. And uh, she had uh, features of uh, medial joint line tenderness with the uh, PFJ signs. So now uh, you definitely have a choice of considering a uni alone with a mobile bearing uni, forgetting about the PFJ as uh, the Oxford unit feels. You have a choice of moving on to a gold standard, which is a total knee arthroplasty, whether a CR or a PS design, or you can think for a bicompartmental resurfacing. No, Manoj, the, even the Oxford group has got more selective uh, lateral compartment in the patellofemoral joint. That is a clear uh, contraindication for uh, even in the Oxford group. Yeah. So this is not the, the AMOA with a little bit of uh, medial patellofemoral OA. This doesn't belong to that group. This is a classical patellofemoral OA with more of lateral uh, PFJ involvement. Yeah. I'm glad with you support my thought process. <laughs> Manoj, one more thing. This lady is 64. So, yeah. you know, if you look at the typical patellofemoral uh, as a subset of uh, arthritis, they are normally, you know, between 45 to 55. Whereas once you start getting a bit older and older, they are actually having knee arthritis also along with that. And also certainly they are coming to an age group within four or five years, they will start developing significant arthritis. So thinking in terms of purely excess uh, as a patellofemoral case in this age group is a bit risky to actually do that. Do what? Uh, purely as a patellofemoral and do just a patellofemoral replacement. So basically, okay. this is a good case for a patellofemoral replacement. The pain has got only anti knee pain, uh, not yeah. bone on bone. I mean, mild patellofemoral uh, arthritis. Uh, this is uh, as good as it gets for a PFJ. No, no. What I'm saying, but, Vijay, is that you got to think about the longevity of this case. So within four yeah. or five years, this lady will start turning into actually a knee arthritis also. And then that is the reason why that these patients then progress and become difficult. So, yeah, so age group-wise, uh, they have actually made very certain criteria. 
Rakesh to be the devil's advocate, there is a uh, interesting paper by Dr. Beverland published way back in 2001 on primary petalar femoral OA treated with TKR without petalar resurfacing, and they had very good outcomes. So the uh, the petalar yeah, but nobody <laughs> agrees to that uh, paper, Krishna. I can assure you that uh, wherever you go in the world, that paper is quoted, but nobody agrees to that paper. Okay, okay, Krishna, would you go ahead? Yeah. I actually heard his lecture but, even at DOA. So this this, uh, this is what was uh, done by Dr. Manoj. Uh, Manoj, I think you should. Yeah. So basically, she had a pristine uh, lateral compartment, very very controlled. She had a medial compartmental arthrosis with a petal femoral arthrosis. Was not good enough for a simple PFJ alone because she would have progressed in next few years for the medial side. So we did a bicompartmental resurfacing. How is the patient doing? So far, so good. Let's see. Let's track her through. Uh, uh, Ma 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 my question, my question will be: uh, Why Wait, not a total? Uh, yeah, I would do a total. Correct. Because this patient mm. is a high BMI patient, even if not too much, but must be around thirty, I am sure. Yeah. And uh, uh, there, is, there is a prim primarily petal of femoral arthritis, but the medial joint was also affected, and that's why you've done the. Uh, unicondylar uh, medial uni. Uh, so wh why did you not choose the total knee? Just yes, for the academic. It's a, it's a wonderful totally good honest. result. See, this is the case, because It was one of the cases, offbeat cases we did through. But normally, if you ask me, the track would be a total knee. I mean, this is just to bring across a discussion matrix. So, uh, Manu, no. just one question here now. You, the company which uh, you do a lot anyway, they have a special implant for this where there is this uh, continuation of a battle of moral into a uni. Uh, do a condylar knee or something they call it, I think. Dewsney. Dewsney, yeah. It has been given yeah. up so, a while ago. It has been yeah, because it was so difficult to match uh, the UKR along with the battle yeah. of moral components. So then th right. then this was advocated. But uh, I think I, we saw uh, somebody else's presentation with a lot of these cases, but done through uh, robot. Uh, because then you can get the precise location of these implants uh, where you want them. So okay. I think the question of Rajiv still bears to mind that when you know primarily that you have two components involved, would TKR be a better option or would still this be a better option? I mean, this is one option, definitely. Yeah. I would say, let me just interject because I've had experience. I was on the design team of the, uh, the deuce, the duocondylar knee. And you raise a critical point that the rotational alignment, ideal rotational alignment of the patellofemoral replacement is going to be different than the ideal rotational alignment of your uni. Because the rotational alignment of your uni is depending upon the ACL footprint and getting that optimal tibia coverage. And you have to relate the position of the femoral component to that rotation. And often you're adding additional external rotation to the patellofemoral arthroplasty. So to link them together and then getting a smooth transition zone of that implant between the cartilage on the lateral surface and the patellofemoral component was very, very difficult. So. The, these uh, deuce components were either a home run out of the park, patients love them, or they had a difficulty. So we, we abandoned and ultimately this implant was recalled. Robotic assistance makes it easier to do a combination of patellofemoral arthroplasty and a medial or lateral uni because you can position the components independently and precisely and avoid overhanging of the components because you can prototype their position. The question is what operation is gonna give you the best result for these patients and the most consistent result for the patients. And it's also combined with what their functional outcome and desire is. So the bicruciate sparing knee is a good option for patients who have uh, either lateral and patellofemoral arthritis or medial and patellofemoral arthritis because you can address more than one component and preserve the proprioception of the ACL-PCL. And it's a good procedure to do with robotic assistance. I think it's very difficult to do a cruciate sparing knee without robotics. But these are the patients, I'm putting these implants in patients who have high functional demands. So someone who's obese and who's you know, not doing a lot of activities, regardless of their age, they don't need as high function, they don't need to drive the Ferrari. They, they are happy driving the Fiat or the, the Ford. 
And patients who are looking to return to surfing or playing softball or cricket who need that proprioception, those are the patients where I'm going to be more willing to expand the indications and do a procedure that's more difficult that has unique complications. So, you know, an obese 64-year-old, a regular PS total knee would be what I would choose. I think this is an elegant case, and I think it's beautifully done. And it's a great case for a discussion. Um, but, you know, just again, like functional demands are really what I'm looking at. But I also think you guys have interesting functional demands. Your standard patient wants to flex their knee to 145 so they can sit on the floor and, and you know, function in that environment. So you have to be very mindful of achieving great flexion to have a satisfactory outcome is my impression working with other surgeons in Asia. It's very well done, uh, Manoj. Uh, did you do it in the uh, same stage or you did it in two anesthesia? Single stage. Single stage, yeah. Must be a big job. So you were to the last case. Uh, 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 Manoj, just one one. The single stage, which one you do first? Right. No, no. The UK or the, uh, the yeah, better yeah. model? It really doesn't make any difference across which one. Okay. Uh, uh, quickly, Krishna, if you can finish uh, up. This is the last case. Yeah. Yeah. So it just covers yeah. the whole gamut of uh, issues with Petala. So this is a 72 year old man who came with uh, pain and instability in the right knee. He had history of a right TKR done four years back. This was a, uh, uh, a PFC knee with history of repeated falls and anterior knee pain and difficulty in climbing upstairs. So he was managing and he was not happy from day one. And uh, this is his x-ray. Uh, Dr. Bose is here, so you can take this case maybe. You need to unmute yourself, sir. I was not paying attention to the history, my apologies. Can you... It's a 72-year-old man. He underwent a TKR four years back. So this okay. is a PFCPS with a petal and not resurfaced, and he had history of recurrent falls and difficulty with stairs right from uh, immediately after surgery, and he was managing somehow. But the uh, episodes of instability had increased, uh, and uh, was very. It's an obvious one with the mal position components uh, mal rotated. You can see the petal is totally dislocated. Yeah. Uh, Tibial cut is wrong, so mal rent as well. So that's caused the um, uh, petla to dislocate. So in my book, it needs a total revision. I would uh, do a complete revision. And I, uh, whatever is necessary for the, I've done a few of these. In these cases, if uh, I would do a lateral release and I do a formal uh, MPFL with the uh, uh, SMET. Okay. Fair enough. I think that's a fair point. Uh, uh, David, any, any thoughts on this case? I agree completely. I think, you know, again, an isolated uh, adding a patella component is not going to fix these problems. And uh, similar to the cases where you just do an isolated component revision of only the femur, only the tibia, they tend to have a high failure rate. So I would revise the femur, the tibia, resurface the patella, and then look at what I needed to do to address the tracking after I had the components in the correct position. Any investigations uh, which would be needed before surgery or would be happy? Going? Kiran, do you have the pre-op x-rays by any chance? Uh, pre-op was a varus knee. I don't have it uh, now. So it was a varus knee, not a valgus knee. It was not. It was, yeah, that's right. So that's the point I was uh, wanting to make uh, because uh, a varus knee with a good patellar tracking before surgery, after surgery, if it is mal tracking, then it is obviously component mal rotation. So it's right. not... Uh, so would you, uh, I would ask this question to Dr. Bose again, if there was a uh, no problem yeah, before okay. the surgery, would you still do a MPFL reconstruction or is it only for the habitually dislocated petal uh, or it's an intraoperative decision? Yeah, the, it's uh, it's uh, partly an intraoperative decision, but uh, you know, when they are um, chronically dislocated, uh, they need some collagen for you for long standing. Uh, I mean, the, 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 even the sports medicine guys, you know, uh, they stress on that. So yeah. they're doing a semi-T augmentation. It's right there. The ligament is right there for you. It doesn't take anything and I would do that because we do a lot of the MPFLs. Very important uh, message for the uh, audience that, you know, the uh, chronically dislocated petal, petala 
you may have to do something more in order to do it and mpfl reconstruction is a good way uh, dr rajiv uh, would you investigate this patient further would you do some other investigation on him just uh, to maybe a ct ct scan three dimensional ct scan uh, and if you see this femoral uh, cut in this patient is it too much of valgus yeah. that's what it looks like on the um, yeah that's absolutely uh, right so uh, this, uh, that's what yeah, vijay has mentioned very correctly that this is the mal rotated mal positioned femur and tibia both so we can see here uh, on the ct scan the, the femur uh, valgus was around 8 degrees on the right side and also the tibial slope was around 16 degrees so uh, both were issues so it's a ps implant with a 16 degrees tibia slope uh, and an 8 degree valgus so this has no shortcut you cannot just do a patellar resurfacing with lateral release in this case needs a complete right. revision which was what was done and uh, uh, we resurfaced the uh, patella and we corrected the alignment of the knee and this patient is around 4 4 years out now or 3 years out and is doing pretty well so as the patella tracking at the end of uh, surgery we just got away with a lateral release and uh, correction of the implant alignment and we got a good patella track yeah it's a good tracking now so, yeah. uh, very well done thank you thank, thank you krishna i think i'll stop the, yeah i think we will call it a day uh now just uh, for the last uh, couple of announcements uh, Uh, first of all let me thank uh, dr manoj wadwa for moderating an excellent webinar today on patellofemoral arthritis lot of things to learn personally i learned a uh, lot of things and uh, we thank all our faculty uh, dr ips oberai and dr din sapadiwala from sports medicine side and uh, especially dr david rowinski you know it's early morning and uh, he could got up on time while his lecture was going on from hawaii for joining today and taking part in each and every case discussion so we thank uh, you know, dr martin uh, redis uh, from tennessee dr uh, rami shoryal from uh, sydney and as well as our own faculty uh, dr krishna kiran Uh, for generating a good uh, amount of discussion out of each and every case was really difficult uh, thank you all and uh, again i am reiterating that our indian journal of orthopedic special issue on arthroplasty is going to come out in september october 2021 we have really got a tremendous response and all the articles are under review process now i request all our reviewers to review those articles and send them early so by the end of july we will come out with uh, the selected articles uh, five from inside country five from outside the country and we have received also two review articles from javed parviji and uh, dr amar ranawat that uh, excellent review articles so you'll get the issue uh, right on time and uh, our next webinar uh, will be on approaches to the hip which way is the better that is the webinar number 18 and the convener will be dr thirdy mohan who is a clinical professor and consultant in orthopedics at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences Kochi and uh, though we hold our webinar on third Saturday of every month but next month uh, APAS is being held on 10th 17th and 24th of July so uh, hence uh, for next month only we'll hold it on 18th of July that is a third Sunday evening and it will focus on the approaches to hip because we got a lot of feedback from our you uh, know young orthopedic surgeons they wanted a webinar on the approaches to the hip I thank one and all, and I especially I thank today to uh, Dr. Shopnil Kani, uh, the assistant professor at KEM Hospital, for uh, handling on the background, and my registrar, Dr. Rona Kothari, also who is handling the Facebook page. Thank you all, and have a nice evening. Thank you. 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 Thank you.